Okay, it seems like the live stream is up now. Sergeants, can you please start your recordings? Computer recording started. Backup is rolling. Cloud is good. Sergeant Bionda, what's your opening statement, please? Sure. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the Committee on Governmental Operations. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification purposes? And to minimize disruptions, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you'd like to submit testimony, please send via email to testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Levin, we are ready to begin. Thank you very much, Sergeant. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm going to gavel in here. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. I am Councilmember Steve Levin. I am serving as chair of the Committee on Governmental Affairs for this hearing, uh, uh, pinch hitting for my friend and colleague, um, uh, uh, Councilmember Cabrera. Um, I want to thank, I want to start off by welcoming everybody and thanking the members of the committee for joining us today. We're joined by Councilmembers Mizell, uh, Councilmember Yeager, Councilmember Kalos. I believe Councilmember Powers, Councilmember Salamanca, um, the public advocate, Shimani Williams, um, and uh, Bill's sponsor, uh, Councilmember Idanis Rodriguez, Councilmember Carlos Menchaca, and, and Councilmember Dharma Diaz. And I think that's it for now. Um, we, uh, expect other council members to join us throughout the, the course of the hearing as well. <clears throat> um, today, the committee will be hearing two bills. The first is introduction 1867, which is sponsored by council member Adonis Rodriguez in relation to allowing lawful permanent residents in New York City to vote in municipal elections. New York City is a city of immigrants. Immigrants make up close to 40% of New York City's population and an even larger share of its workforce. Immigrants are a vital part of the city's economic, cultural, and civic landscape. This bill would allow certain immigrants who are not yet US citizens to vote in municipal elections. The bill would create a new class of voters called municipal voters. A municipal voter would be any individual who is A, not a US citizen, B, either a lawful permanent resident or otherwise authorized to work in the US. C, has been a resident of New York City for at least 30 consecutive days. D, meets all the qualifications for registering to vote under the election law other than US citizenship. And E, has registered to vote as a municipal voter with the Board of Elections in New York City. Municipal voters, would be able to vote in any election for mayor, comptroller, public advocate, borough president, or council member, or any city ballot initiative. Municipal voters would not be authorized to vote in any state or federal elections. The Board of Elections would be tasked with implementing the bill among other things, they would be required to create a municipal voter registration form to be used by municipal voters, create a single registered voter list with a distinguished marker for municipal voters, and provide informational notices to municipal voters about the law. The Board of Elections would be prohibited from requiring municipal voters to, uh, to form a separate line or a vote in a separate location. The bill would also include privacy protections for municipal voters. Finally, the bill would create an advisory group that would provide recommendations regarding any problems 
or potential improvements with respect to the municipal voting process. The advisory group would be made up of five members chaired by the public advocate. There would be four representatives of community-based organizations, two appointed by the mayor and two by the speaker of the council. There are many important questions about this bill that will need to be addressed. Representatives from the administration, the board of elections, the campaign finance board, community groups, and other organizations are here with us today to speak about the bill. We look forward to their testimony. The second bill that we are hearing today is introduction 2316, sponsored by council member Rafael Salamanca in relation to city agency attendance at council hearings. The bill would require that at least one representative of each city agency called to testify before a council, city council committee remain in attendance for the duration of the committee hearing. And with that, I wanna thank my fellow council members, Rodriguez and Salamanca for their leadership on these pieces of legislation today. They will speak more about their bills in a moment, I also wanna thank our committee staff, CJ Murray, Emily Forgioni, Elizabeth Cronk, and Sebastian Bakke for their work on this. I would now like to invite council member Salamanca, sponsor of intro 2316 to give a statement. How are you, Mr. Chair, can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, um, yes, that's that's right. um, my, my bill is just a very common sense <clears throat> bill. Uh, we know throughout uh, our hearings, um, we have many uh, members from the community that wanna come and give public testimony. And many times uh, the community feels that their testimony is not being heard uh, by the appropriate agency. Uh, given point NYCHA, uh, many times as chairs of committees, we allow city agencies um, especially the commissioners, uh, to speak first. Once they give their testimony and they hear questions from council members, they leave. And the question is, is our city agencies actually hearing to the concerns of residents uh, in the city of New York? And so what this bill would require, would, would do, it would require city agencies uh, to leave someone, preferably a decision maker throughout the entire hearing so that they can listen to, to New Yorkers and they can bring back that information and really bring positive change. With that, I thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you very much, Councilmember Salamanca. Um, I would now like to invite Councilmember Udanis Rodriguez, sponsor of intro 1867 to give a statement. Thank you, Chair. I also would like to thank Chairman uh, Fernando Cabrera, as the chairman also of this committee, for being one of those who signing on this bill. Uh, this committee has nine members, and six of those members support this bill. It means that we have the vote to pass at the governmental committee, as also we have the veto power number at the council. I want to say that when you look at the back where I am, I'm there protesting a lot of injustice and invasion in the whole world, fighting for democracy. That photo you see back there is myself being in the 80s, organizing against one of the most important fighting accomplishments that I had got, fighting against tuition increase and budget cut on the governor Cuomo. We were told that we couldn't win the fight, but I won together with my colleague that fight I didn't have a citizenship. I had a green card, which was that I had from 83 to 2000. During those years, I washed dishes at a restaurant. During those years, I worked at two Broadway, working in a cafeteria. I worked as a delivery taxi. I was a student activist. I became a teacher after graduating 93 from City College and paid my taxes too. It is so unfair that we, the most progressive city, are not ready to expand voting rights, to reestablish the rights of individuals who pay the taxes, that has green card, that has working paper, 
to have the same right that residents in this city had when in 1900, the New York City population was 96% white, 2% black. Latinos and Asian were not counted. Today, population is 29% Latinos, 24% black, 15% Asian. We are the majority. But this coalition is more than black. This coalition is more than Latino. This coalition is about Jewish, Irish, Italian, a lot of people who are ready to say it took a lot of decades for women to get the right to vote in, in 1919. It took a lot of decades for people of color to have the right to vote because this constitution that we have was only allowed white men who had a lot of land to vote in this election. Up to 20, 20, 19, 1926, it was not a required to be a citizen to vote in local elections. For Mayor de Blasio, we've been in this fight for so many years. As I was marching those days, you were, we were organizing on support of the Sandinista in Nicaragua, or the members of El Salvador, everyone who were organizing for the freedom of Nelson Mandela. This is our time for you to leave the legacy. If the question will ask to you about this, why don't you take that approach that you're ready to lead this fight? And if we need to get to Albany, we go to Albany together. You ask all of us to go to Albany to fight for major control. But you know what? We are here today as a result of a long process. This bill has been introduced, he been write, have been writing by, to so many other uh, colleagues. This bill, as I was selected in 2000, 2009, was carried on by council member Danny John, Margaret Chen. Tell me if I was wrong, but when I put any LS request at the council, the Ellis request is revised and the lawyer get back to me and say, we cannot write this bill because this is not legal. So how the lawyer, the council been written this bill over and over, how we went through this process having so many meetings and the immigration coalition has their own lawyer and they're ready and they're ready to fight if it's needed. Can it go through a lawsuit? Probably because we also have right wing individuals in the city of New York who always become an obstacle we want to, when we want to move the immigrant rights agenda in the city. We were here from then today, as we were here in the discussion about why we should not pass this bill. But the poll that being released by the Immigration Coalition say, most of 60% of New Yorkers support this bill. This bill is supported by the New York State NWACP, by the House of Justice, led by Reverend Sharpton, by the Borough President Eric Adams, Gerd Brewer, Ruben Diaz, Donovan Richard, by the Public Advocate Jumani Williams, by the Council Member, it, it, by the Council Member Brad Lander, by the Controller Scott Stringer. Are so many New Yorkers so wrong to move this bill? Or is it that some people have some fear that this bill will change the landscape or the voting participation in New York City? I would like to believe that I'm wrong. I would like to believe that no progressive individuals are there to be an obstacle to move this bill. When we were running to, for, the, for the speaker's seat, that question was asked at the New York One debate to all council members who were running, including myself, do you support the municipal voting rights? And everyone said yes, including my colleague, Speaker Corey Johnson that I hope that also I can get his support to move this bill. This is not about a favor. This is about no taxation without representation. Something that I was teaching my student in the 15th year that I was teaching social studies in the New York City Public School. We need to recognize the contribution made by our immigrant brothers and sisters. This is not about doing a favor to immigrants by allowing them to vote. If they pay their taxes as I did when I had green card, then they should have a right to elect the local leaders. And if people have a problem with it, with this, then they should move to another town or another country that has not been built by immigrants. They should move to other places in the South, in the Midwest, that they are trying to stop immigrant rights to be protected. Elections are not only important, but in many cases, they are the key to create change at the federal, state, and city level. However, 
can we really consider ourselves representative for all members of our community when there are hundreds of thousands of potentially eligible voters who are being denied the right to vote? I wanted to make it very clear for everyone, neither the federal or state law prevents New York City from extending the right to vote in municipal election to non-citizens. New York City has a power to enfranchise non-citizens, New Yorkers. And when many times we've been told that we were not able, that we didn't have the right certain team, Major de Blasio, we did it. And we did it together with you. We did it with a paid sick day. We did on closing Rikers Island. We did it with the UPK. We need to do it. And you should do it with your leadership so that you can leave this as your last important legacy for the whole city and for the whole nation. In a time when many states are passing voter suppression laws, the like of which we haven't seen since the Jim Crow era, New York City must be seen as a sample for other progressive cities to follow. Nearly 400 voter suppression laws have been proposed in 48 states after the last presidential election. Passing this law would make this the largest addition of eligible voters in 50 years. The city of Tacoma Park in Maryland has been allowing non-citizens to vote in the municipal elections since the 1990s. And many of the arguments our conservative colleagues have been making against this bill have never happened. There hasn't been any issue or up uproar against or because non-citizens were able to vote. 11 other cities in Maryland in, and Illinois allow non-citizens the right to vote alongside three other countries. Ireland, Sterling, and Australia allow their non-citizens to vote as also Colombia and Spain. We go to Europe to learn about Vision Zero and we cannot look at Europe and Latin America to look about how people who are not citizens should be allowed to vote in local election. And we call ourselves progressive. Immigrants in New York City own 52% of local businesses and contribute over $100 billion to the citywide GDP. During the height of the pandemic, it was our immigrants New Yorkers who kept New York City running when a lot of people moved to the Hobson Valley and to Long Island. Over half of our frontline essential workers are immigrants and approximately one fifth are non-citizen New Yorkers. They have earned the right to participate in a local election to decide who are the leader, who will be making decisions of keeping the street clean, invest on quality education, who create good pay job, who create opportunity for women and minority to have access to local small businesses. We have fought hard to pass laws that allow non-citizens to get their driver's license, create IDNYC, and create higher education scholarship to non to non-citizen New Yorkers. We were told many times this was not possible, and yet we made it possible. It is now time that we emphasize our immigrant New Yorkers so that they can elect and hold the local leader accountable. To leave nearly 1 million vote voters out of our city democracy process is un-American, is unprogressive. In a country built on the back of immigrants, we must ask ourselves, why haven't we already passed a bill that will enfranchise those who have green cards and working permits? It is because there are people who believe that if you extend voting rights to immigrants, we will dilute and make the vote of citizens less important. That's not how democracy works. Allowing people to vote benefit us all. It is our duty to return the right to vote to non-citizen immigrants living in New York City at a time when the city today look different than what it looked in the 1900s. Pasemos todo este proyecto de ley que le va a dar la oportunidad a inmigrantes, judíos, anglosajones, africanos, latinos, asiáticos, que pagan sus impuestos, que tienen residencia, que tienen permiso de trabajo, a poder votar en las elecciones locales de la Ciudad de Nueva York. Yes, we can. Sí, podemos. Thank you very much, Councilmember Rodriguez. <coughs> um, 
And uh, before we uh, turn it over to the administration for testimony, I, I want to just acknowledge the good work of the chair of this committee, Fernanda Cabrera, um, um, and, and everything that he's done for the last uh, almost four years as chair. And, um, and uh, I, I just want to make sure we acknowledge his good work. And with that, I'll turn it over to the committee, to the council, um, to administer the, um, uh, the oath to the administration who will be testifying. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is CJ Murray. I'm counsel to the Committee on Governmental Operations. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind our panelists that you'll be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by a member of our staff. I'll be ca calling on panelists to testify periodically throughout the hearing, so please listen for your name to be called. All hearing participants may submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. At today's hearing, the first panel will consist of members of the public. After that, there will be several panels consisting of representatives from the administration, and then additional members of the public will testify. There will be time for council member questions after each panel. If a council member would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes the panelists to answer your question. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, there will not be a second round of questioning outside of questions from the bill sponsors and the committee chair. We'll now hear from our first public panel. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and we'll let you know when your time is up. Once I have called on you, please wait until the sergeant has announced that you may begin before starting your test testimony. I would now like to welcome Melissa John to testify, followed by Murad Bawada, and then Fulvia Vargas de Leon. Melissa John, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Good morning, everyone. My name is Melissa John. I am a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago by birth. I'm a New Yorker by choice, classroom teacher by profession, taxpayer, green card holder, and one of the individuals that would benefit from this bill. Voting is a privilege, and it has been a privilege extended to white males, and that has been the pathology and power structure of this country. It is a solid vestige of post-colonial America. Historically, black and brown bodies on American soil have had their respective voices discounted. The existence and passage of the Naturalization Act of 1790, which limited citizenship to any alien being a free white person who had been in the US for two years is one relic that supported that second class citizenship. The Municipal Rights Bill, a local law to amend the city charter would benefit individuals like myself, green card holders, um, and there is no illegality to this bill as it already exists in different parts of the United States, in California and 11 municipalities in Maryland. However, this legislation passing in New York City is the catalyst for immigrant suffrage rights in other cities with large immigrant hubs. Immigrants have always been the cornerstone of New York City's culture and commerce, yet continue to have their political voices stifled and be denied power at the polls while still contributing financially to the neighborhoods and boroughs they now, come, they now call home. This disparity once again became evident during the onset of the pandemic in March, 2020. Many immigrants who are also essential workers expose themselves daily to a deadly virus in order to keep countless New Yorkers safe. As the 2021 mayoral elections approach and they've come to a close right now, um, this bill is very important as it would allow nearly 1 million of my fellow immigrants, New Yorkers, to have a voice in New York City local elections. We contribute to the labor force. We contribute to the business economy. We are a tax-paying community whose taxes also will be paying the salaries of those public officials that individuals have decided to elect. And for our voices, it's really important for it to be a part of the political process. Continuous engagement in the democratic process is a revolutionary act. The Municipal Voting Rights Bill will arm immigrants with the tools to fully engage in the political process 
while concurrently on the pathway towards citizenship and create a holistic and comprehensive comprehensive voting landscape reflective of New York City's diversity. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Murad Awada, followed by Fulvia Vargas de Leon, and then Carol Wacy. Murad Awada, you may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Murad Awada. I am the executive director of the New York Immigration Coalition. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. The New York Immigration Coalition supports both bills being heard today. It would be great if every agency had a stay for the entirety of a hearing so they could listen to how legislation actually affects the people of the city, especially legislation like Introduction 1867, which, which has several dozen individuals and organizations who took time out of their workday to urge the council to restore voting rights to immigrant New Yorkers. We live in a democracy and yet nearly 1 million New Yorkers can't vote. These New Yorkers live here, work here, go to school here, and pay taxes here. According to the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, just over half of New Yorkers with green cards or other legal status have lived here for over 10 years. These New Yorkers are a central part of our city, and the city as a whole is worse off by not having their voices reflected at the ballot box. Right now, so many other states are trying to take away people's rights to vote. But here in New York City, we also have taken away people's voting rights. One of the untold stories of US history is how common and legal non-citizen voting was for the first 150 years of our history. Immigrant New Yorkers used to be able to cast votes for mayor, city representatives until that right was taken away in a racist nativist backlash to new types of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe and East Asia. Despite this, the New York City, New York City maintained non-citizen voting in school boards until 2002, when school boards were eliminated. The city council has an opportunity to right this wrong and restore non-citizen voting. Failing to pass introduction 1867 this year means failing not only, a near, not only nearly a million New Yorkers, but their communities as well. What we are demanding is simply that residents of New York City get to vote on who represents New York City. The people who would be enfranchised by this legislation may not have the piece of paper that says they're a US citizen, but they are absolutely New Yorkers. The ongoing pandemic has demonstrated just how vital these New Yorkers are to our city. Half of all frontline essential workers are immigrants and one in five are non-citizen. How can you look at these New Yorkers in the eye and tell them that you appreciate that they literally risked their lives to keep this city functioning, but you don't think they deserve to vote for their city council member or mayor? Because that is what not passing this legislation means. It means you're, you're telling New Yorkers they must continue to put their bodies at risk, and, but you don't care about their voices. It means keeping one out of every nine New Yorkers on the sidelines of democracy. Right. Voting rights are political power and a lack of power means that some people, some neighborhoods and some issues are treated differently and given lower priority than others. Failing to pass this legislation will delay democracy and diminish civic eagerness within immigrant communities and communities of color. Democracy cannot wait. At a time when democracy itself is under attack worldwide, this council should lead the way on voting rights and show the world what 21st century democracy looks like. This legislation has been around for a long time. It's been talked about and debated. A supermajority of the council supports it. Most residents of our city support it. How much longer do 1 million New Yorkers have to wait for their voting rights? This legislation has the votes to pass the council today. Don't let another election year, another election, another year, another day go by. Pass this legislation now. Thank you. Thank you. I will now welcome Fulvia Vargas de Leon to testify. After that, I'll be calling on Carol Wacy and then Crystal Walthall. Fulvia Vargas de Leon, you may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. Time starts now. Good morning, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Fulvia Vargas de Leon and I'm an associate counsel with Latino Justice Pearl Duff. 
Latino Justice is one of the country's leading civil rights legal defense funds. And part of our work focuses on advocating to ensure the enfranchisement of those who are traditionally excluded from the electoral process. At a time where many states across our nation are enacting broad voter suppression laws to make it more difficult to participate in the franchise, New York City should lead in enacting legislation that seeks to enfranchise close to 1 million New Yorkers who currently have no voice in the electoral process. Citizenship has never been a constitutional prerequisite for voting and history indicates instead that localities and states looked at a person's domicile to determine whether they were allowed to vote. The notion that citizenship is required for voting is new when put in context of American history and its practice is deeply rooted in a racist history of attempting to keep marginalized communities from having a say in who is elected. While some may deem introduction 1867 as, as a revolutionary measure in terms of voting rights, between 1968 and 2002 in this very city, non-citizens were able to vote in and run for school board elections. We recognized then that non-citizens should have a say and be actively engaged in the manner in which their community schools were managed. Thus, what we're seeking here is actually a restoration of the right to vote in local elections. We expect immigrants to show up for the city day in and day out, even in the midst of a pandemic. They are your teachers, delivery people, local grocer, your colleagues, your next door neighbors. And yet we say to them, live in the city, send your kids to school here, work here and even pay taxes here. But if you want to have a say in, the, in who runs the city, if you want to have a say in the legislation that is passed in the city, you don't meet the necessary requirements. Introduction 1867 is a signal of the conundrum that exists in calling many in our immigrant community our essential workers, expecting them to show up and risk their lives for the city, yet still denying them the ability to have their voices heard when it comes to the electoral process. It is time to change this arbitrary practice and empower all of our community to act and affect change through voting. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Carol Wasey, followed by Crystal Walthall and then Nora Moran. Carol Wasey, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time starts now. Thank you very much. My name is Carol Wasey. I'm the president and CEO of Women Creating Change. We're a nonprofit based here in New York City that increases civic engagement and awareness for women who have systemically been excluded from civic processes. I want to thank you, Acting Chair Levin, for inviting us to participate and submit testimony. I am here to submit testimony in support of intro uh, 1867 to restore, not expand, not give something new, but to restore voting rights to nearly 1 million New Yorkers with work authorizations and green cards. At Women Creating Change, we've been advocating for voting rights and civic engagement for more than 100 years. And in 2021, this work continues. Having been directly involved in the women's suffrage movement, WCC is proud to raise our voices once again to expand democracy, make sure everybody can participate. And we're proud to be partners with our City Our Vote Coalition and our incredible partners, both at the New York Immigration Coalition and United Neighborhood Houses. This legislation is a natural extension of our early work, and we're proud to be a part of it. Over my 30 year career, I've worked in politics and policy and philanthropy, nonprofits, media and advocacy. My work at WCC is really a return to some of my activist roots. My own family um, immigrated to the US in the late 60s. Um, my siblings, my parents and I were all green card holders for a long time. My feminist mother encouraged me to get be active and to participate in our new home country. Um, I was happy to do that. I fought for things like the Equal Rights Amendment back in the 70s, Social Security, pay equity, all these things from an early age. I've always been an engaged citizen, but I couldn't vote also um, until I became a citizen in the 1990s, I was in my 20s and I shouldn't have had to wait, just like so many people shouldn't have to wait right now. Um, you, as we've all been saying, immigrants are really a backbone to not only New York City, but to our country. 
Um, and they shouldn't be taxed without being represented in every way. New York City should be a leader on this. We should be proudly out front. Um, it's really quite sad that we haven't led, and it's great to have so many members really putting their foot forward and really calling upon others to lead. We know that local elections are not only as consequential, many often, many times more consequential than federal or state elections. They really impact our day-to-day -day lives. And this is a real opportunity for all of us. We wanna restore the vote. I wanna thank the 33 council members and our public advocate for really getting out front and supporting these goal, this, um, this legislation. And I wanna urge the city council to put this to a vote Restore this vote. There's no democracy unless all can participate in democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Crystal Walthall, followed by Nora Moran, and then Mia McDonald. Crystal Walthall, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. The time starts now. Hello, good morning. My name is Crystal Walthall. I am the executive director of Faith in New York. Faith in New York is part of Faith in Action, the largest grassroots community organizing organization in the country, and I'm glad to be here this morning. I am here representing thousands of people of faith in New York City and to uplift the moral imperative of intro 1867. We have, a, we have a moral obligation to the almost 1 million New Yorkers who currently do not have a voice in our city government who do not have the power, who do not currently have the power to uplift their voice in the vision and building of New York City, of their communities, of their schools, of their blocks. Passing intro 1867 not only expands and restores this, um, this democratic right to these residents, it also rejects the nativist, the racist, and the other um, policies that were in place to even make, to even strip this voting right. New York City is home to more than 3 million immigrants. We are a city built on immigrants. We, we rely on their labor, their culture, their dollar, their influence, and yet do not give them the voice to be able to determine things like sanitation pickup, how their dollar is being spent in their communities, how um, systems and other things in their communities will help benefit their children, their families, and create a, selfer, a safer quality of life for our communities. How can we do that? How can we say that we love and protect our neighbor? How can we say that we are um, truly living into democracy when we are actively creating a space where we are taking someone's labor, taking someone's dollar, taking someone's culture, and then saying, no, you do not have the ability to actually speak on what will be beneficial to you, your neighbor, your family. I say that it, that is a, a space where we are not acting in a space of morality and we have the opportunity to change that. What does this mean by passing intro 1867? That means increased civic engagement in our communities. And many folks, I believe today on this city council, that would mean that your parents will have the opportunity to vote, your loved ones, your cousins, your neighbor, those who support you actually have the opportunity to vote for you. This means that it'll change the landscape of our communities and the quality of life. This means that those who are on the front lines risking their lives during COVID every day actually have a say in the recovery of our city. My Christian faith calls me to love on my neighbor, to care for the widow, the, orf the orphan. It also encourages me to dismantle the systems of oppression that prevent us from living the lives that we have been called to as our, as our creator has deemed it. And so I call on the city council today to restore this voting right for our immigrant residents. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Nora Moran, followed by Mia McDonald. Nora Moran, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. The time starts now. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify this morning. My name is Nora Moran. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at United Neighborhood Houses. We work with New York City settlement houses and represent 44 settlement houses across the state. Um, UNH you know, has supported intro 1867 for several years, has been supportive of uh, you know, the concept of expanding voting rights for many years. Um, and that really comes from our settlement house members. For over a century, 
They've driven higher levels of civic engagement in their neighborhoods and have a very long history of welcoming immigrants. Um, they work very closely to promote civic engagement. Uh, they lead nonpartisan voter mobilization efforts, census outreach efforts, um, and see often uh, individuals who are very excited to make their communities better and their neighborhoods better, um, but are denied that one fundamental way in which they can do so, which is the ability to vote in local elections. Uh, and for UNH, we really saw the urgency of this bill during the COVID-19 pandemic. Choices were being made that impacted people's day-to-day -day lives around schools, around healthcare, um, uh, whether or not, you know, who was an essential worker, what businesses were essential. Um, and there were nearly 1 million people who could not make their voices heard and weigh in on those issues in a very fundamental way. Um, lots of my colleagues have noted you know, this is this bill would really restore voting rights. Uh, I've noted the long history in this country of having non-citizens vote in elections. Um, and, you know, additionally, we've done different kinds of legal analysis as a coalition. Uh, we've not found anything in the state or federal constitution that would prohibit New York City from doing this and from passing this law. Uh, we really feel that the time is right to pass intro 1867. There's a groundswell of support for the bill. Majority of council members supporting it, nearly 70 organizations as part of the Our City, Our Vote Coalition supporting it, um, as well as many organizations who are ready uh, to work hard on implementation of this bill and make sure that it is implemented well and safely and that individuals know their rights uh, when the time comes for them to be able to, to vote in local elections. Um, and I just close by saying, as we're seeing states across the country take action to suppress voting rights, uh, we in New York City have an opportunity to change that national discussion and expand voting rights uh, in municipal elections and enfranchise nearly 1 million people who uh, would be able to vote. So thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to testify um, and happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Mia McDonald, followed by Assemblywoman Catalina Cruz. Mia McDonald, you may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. Your time starts now. Good morning, Chair Cabrera and members of the committee. I'm Mia McDonald, political manager at the New York Working Families Party. Thanks so much for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Intro 1867. Uh, the New York Working Families Party is a multiracial progressive coalition of individual members, labor organizations, and community groups com committed to building a state rooted in equity and justice. Central to our goal is upholding, expanding, and realizing a true democracy, which at its core should ensure democratic representation for all of our neighbors and afford the right to vote to those who make the city what it is. Today, nearly 1 million non-citizen New Yorkers are denied that right. Our neighbors contribute to our city, pay taxes, are active in their communities, and most importantly, are just as, if not more impacted by the decisions made by elected officials, yet still unable to choose them. The right to vote could and should be designed along residential, not citizenship lines. This is a matter of equality, true representation, and transformative justice. During this ongoing pandemic, we've seen the essential work of our non-citizen neighbors perform to keep the city running. Half of all frontline essential workers are immigrants and one in five are non-citizen New Yorkers. They risk their lives serving as medical professionals, keeping pharmacies and grocery stores open and keeping our buildings clean. Many are delivery workers who are making an average of less than $8 an hour without basic worker protections and without a voice in government to hold those in power accountable. These workers absorb the most risk in this crisis and should have a say in what recovery looks like. As our city's immigrant population is overwhelmingly Black, Brown, and Asian, this is a critical matter, matter of racial justice. Our systems of policing, immigration, education, and housing have long produced racial inequity, and expanding the right to vote moves us closer to racial equity in our city. At the Working Families Party, we strive to be an organization that is inclusive and representative of New York, which crucially includes our non-citizen neighbors. As a democratic organization and political party, non-citizen members vote on who the Working Families Party endorses. And to ensure our processes are accessible to all, we've held candidate endorsement interviews simultaneously in five different languages. We are an organization that, is that has revised our model and practiced the work of internal democ uh, democracy to ensure our political decisions and endorsements reflect our communities. And along with many of our member organizations, we strive to model fair, more inclusive processes, and we're calling on New York City to do the same. We're a proud member of the Our City, Our Vote Coalition, and we urge the City Council to do the right thing and pass intro 1867 immediately. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next, we will hear from Assemblywoman Catalina Cruz. Assemblywoman Cruz, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. The time starts now. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Catalina Cruz and I'm the assembly member representing Corona, Jackson Heights and Elmhurst. I represent the most diverse district in the country where more than 150 languages are spoken. Of the approximately 123,000 members of my community, 60% were born in another country and 40% are non-citizens. This includes permanent residents, DACA recipients, refugees, and definitely undocumented people. Most of us came to this country looking for a better future for our families. We pay taxes, we send our children to our schools, we open up businesses, we ride mass transit and use our hospitals, just like you and I. But unlike you and I, they don't get to choose who represents them and their values. They don't get to vote for those making decisions over the future of their children, the laws that govern their businesses, how mass transit is invested in, or even their health care. These non-citizen New Yorkers pay taxes to the tune of $10 billion each year, but they have no influence as to how that money will be invested back into their communities. This is taxation without representation, which stands contrary to the very principles on which our country was founded. In show 1867 will extend voting rights to close to a million New Yorkers who deserve the right to choose whether you or even I represent them, but that's gonna be a conversation for another day. Over the last 18 months, we saw over and over again how many of these families put their lives at risk so that many of you could stay at home and be safe during quarantine. As Murad said earlier, half of all those frontline workers of those essential immigrant workers, one out of every five are non-citizens. Add to that the many legal permanent residents and DACA recipients, or refugees who are nurses, doctors, pharmacists, and kept our families alive. Standing with immigrants shouldn't just be a campaign tagline. Supporting intro 1867 tells our neighbors, tells your constituents, because every single one of you has immigrants in your community. It tells them that they matter. It tells them that their voice matters. But when you stand against them, it also tells them that they're only needed during campaign. And before I end, I wanna address a statement made by Mayor de Blasio and regurgitated and probably will be addressed by some of the folks here today who stand against this bill. The non-citizen voting is against the constitution, it's unconstitutional. Well, it's already happening around the country in more than 10 towns in Maryland, five towns in Massachusetts and Portland, Maine, Washington DC is looking at it. And guess what? The courts haven't overturned that. This legislation does not violate federal law. It actually grants, the states are granted the discretion to choose who gets to vote in our municipal elections. That is exactly what you're doing. Now, one of the things I, I think it's really important is that over the last year, we saw how much the voice of immigrants is needed. I'm expired. I'll just say one last thing. Every single one of us wants to talk about how much we stand with immigrants over the last year. This is when it counts. This is the time that you get to actually put your vote where your mouth is. Thank you so much, Assembly Member. Um, now, uh, Committee Council, I think we're going to um, have Council Member Yeager. I'm gonna recognize Council Member Yeager for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I see the public advocate uh, has his hand up and I, I would yield to uh, his stature as an ex officio member of this committee if the chair wants to recognize him first. Okay, public advocate. Hello, hello, can everybody yes, hear me? Sir. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Levin. Uh, thank you, Council Member Yeager. Uh, very much appreciate it. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Jermaine Williams, uh, Public Advocate, City of New York. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Cabrera, and a special shout to uh, Council Member Idanis Rodriguez and uh, Salamanca for both their bills. Uh, I'll be speaking primarily on Council Member Idanis Rodriguez's bill. I do first want to lift up the plight of the 13,000 uh, Haitian nationals at our border that the President is trying to send back very often. 
plight of black immigrants are not lifted up as much as they should be. So I want to start off with that. Uh, immigrant New Yorkers shape our city in countless ways, but many are locked out of the electoral processes. This means city residents who fund, use, and provide essential government services have no political voice in how these services are funded and operated. It also means that elected leaders have no political incentive to advance policies that are of interest to these residents, even when those policies most adversely affect, affect them. As a sanctuary city that prides itself on its immigrant past, present, and future, uh, this must change. Uh, as a first-generation American, a son of immigrants from Grenada, I am proud to co-sponsor the Op City Our Vote Bill until 1867 by Councilmember Rodriguez, which would restore, and I think it's important that we continue to say that, we simply restore the right of non-citizen New Yorkers who have green cards and work authorizations to vote in municipal elections. Expanding the franchise through this bill will strengthen civic engagement, government accountability, and immigrant rights. I strongly urge my colleagues to pass this legislation. I'd like to note that while this bill is transformative, it is not unprecedented. Uh, I hear a lot of pushback of legality. Uh, maybe it's one of logistics that we can move through because there are already nine municipalities in Maryland where non-citizens are not excluded from the franchise. Barnesville, Chevy Chase, Sections 5 and 3, Glen Echo, Hyattsville, Martin's Editions, Mount Rainier, Riverdale Park, Somerset, and Tacoma Park. Additionally, in Chicago and San Francisco, non-citizens are able to vote in school board elections. Further, New Yorkers who were non-citizens were previously able to vote in school board elections from 1969 to the dissolution of the school board system in 2002. It is also critical to note that non-citizens had voting rights in this country for much longer than they did not have voting rights from the founding of the country until the wave of anti-immigrant sentiment in the 19th and early 20th centuries, non-citizens have the right to vote in many states and federal territories. Let's be clear, the exclusion of immigrants from voting is a political choice rooted in racism and xenophobia. We can get this done and we have a duty to, whether it's furthering language access, keeping immigrants and custom enforcements off our streets, securing labor rights for delivery workers and street vendors, supporting small businesses, on improving and legalizing substandard basements. This city has a multitude of priority initiatives that are affecting the immigrant community. It is critical that we amplify their voice and governance by extending them the right to vote. Very often in these situations, it is uh, people who are of privilege trying to prevent people from getting that privilege. The question we have to ask is why, uh, whether it is marriage or it is voting rights. It is what are we trying to prevent and why are we trying to prevent it? Uh, we should allow people who uh, have the worst impact of our policies, the ability to, to, to vote on who will make those policies. And as I mentioned, we are simply restoring something uh, that I believe was wrongfully taken away from people in the first place. Uh, so I don't have any questions. I want to make that statement. I want to thank uh, all of the panelists for the work that they're doing uh, to get this forward. Special shout out to the Assemblywoman uh, who's been doing this work for quite some time and is a shining example uh, of uh, the people we're speaking about. Um, this should be a proud moment for New York City. It should be a proud moment for our nation as we're pushing back on the xenophobia we're seeing. I'm hoping that our colleagues support it and that our mayor uh, show some leadership in a time where leadership is lacking uh, from that side of City Hall. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilman Yeager, again, and Chair Peace and Blessing. Thank you very much, Public Advocate. Uh, we'll now call on Councilmember Yeager. Time starts now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll, I'll speak briefly. Uh, uh, first of all, with, with respect uh, uh, for my colleague, uh, the public advocate, and, and he's 100% right, uh, as have many of the speakers before, uh, the, this is a city of immigrants. Um, and no city in the nation does more for its immigrant population than New York City. And that's been true, and it's been getting better. And that doesn't mean that our work is done. One of the things we can and should do is assist people who want a pathway to citizenship, who are legal residents of this city, who have, or this nation, who have green cards. That's something that my office does. That's something that many of our colleagues in the council do uh, um, by having attorneys in our office who assist people with the paperwork. We ought to do more as a city and help provide the funding that's necessary to pay the fees for people who can't afford it, who want to turn their legal, legal residency in the United States into citizenship, and we should. I too uh, am a first generation American. My father came here on a boat with his older brother and his parents. Um, I am the son and grandson of immigrants. 
my mother's father escaped Nazi Europe uh, through the generosity of the good people of Japan and subsequently China was able to live out the war there before being welcomed here into the United States. And I'm now a member of the city council. That story is not unique to me. That's everybody's story in the city. And it's been the story of New Yorkers for several hundred years. The question before us, in my view, is not whether this is the right thing to do, or whether this is the wrong thing to do. The question is whether we, as the New York City Council, have the legal authority to do this. Now, many colleagues of mine who have spoken so far, and many of the speakers who have spoken so far, have focused on whether or not this violates federal law. It doesn't. It doesn't violate federal law. It doesn't violate the United States Constitution. It is, however, unconstitutional because it violates the New York State Constitution. The New York State Constitution sets forth the obligations, the rights of cities and municipalities in the state, and it sets forth the legal um, uh, positions that governments in this state can take. Cities like ours are a creature of the state. We only exist by the states granting us the authority to do it. The Constitution is not silent on this question. It speaks as to who may vote. Now, a lot of attention has been focused on school board elections. My father was a three-term member of a school board until school boards were disbanded by the state legislature uh, early this uh, century. Parents were entitled to vote in school board elections whether or not they were citizens of the United States. That was a right granted not by the city of New York, not by this body, by the state of New York. So when Assemblywoman Cruz, a colleague of mine for whom I have an enormous amount of respect, uh, is here before the council talking about what we ought to do, I turn the question back to her and to her colleagues in the state legislature. This is something that they ought to do. They ought to pass this in the state legislature, amend the constitution. And if this is what the state legislature wishes to do, they couldn't do it, but we can't. Now, this is not a unique uh, a statement from me. I do this frequently here in the council, talk about the things that we pass that we're not allowed to pass. And as frequently as I mentioned this, the courts back me up. So we can pass this if we want to. How many sponsors is irrelevant. We need a majority to pass it. More than a majority is sponsoring this bill. But the question is whether or not it will become law. It will not because it will be promptly thrown out because we do not have the legal authority to pass it. Now again, this doesn't mean that those who oppose this are xenophobic. It doesn't mean that those who oppose this don't like immigrants. It doesn't mean that those who oppose this don't respect the immigrants of the United States, don't respect the people here in New York City. Nobody in this council, to my knowledge, is a descendant of anybody who came here on the Mayflower. And even if they were, they're still immigrants. Everybody in this council, everybody that we represent is an immigrant. This is a city of immigrants but we also have to respect what the rules are. And the rules are that we are a creature of the authority granted to us by the state of New York. And the state of New York has chosen not to grant us the authority to enact this legislation. This is a matter reserved for the state. It's called preemption. We all know that because we talk about it all the time. So we can have this hearing and I imagine it's going to be a very long hearing and I will be here as long as I can. As you know, my holiday begins a little later today. So as long as I can be here, I will be. But it's not about our authority to pass this. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member Yeager. Okay, I'll turn it back over to the committee council. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will now call on council members in the order they've used. Oh, oh, actually, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Council, I, I do actually have a couple of questions for the panel if, if, if they're still here. That's okay. Sure, go ahead, please. Okay. Um, this, could, this is an open question for anybody on the panel. Um, uh, do any of you have an estimate of how many New Yorkers would become eligible to vote under this bill? And I think if you're not able to unmute yourself, just uh, you can raise your hand and, and, uh, and the council will unmute you. It's about 900,000 people. 900,000 people. 
Um, how many registered voters are there in New York? Does that, I don't I don't know the name, that number off the top of my head. Probably a couple million, three, yeah. three million maybe, three four million. Um, okay, so this would this would um, this would uh, uh, augment the number of registered voters in New York City by easily double digits in terms of percentage. Potentially, yeah. Um, and then um, I think uh, the public advocate mentioned other jurisdictions that have, have implemented non-citizen voting that have had uh, overcome um, uh, overcome any significant implementation issues. If so, are the if you're um, if anyone has any um, knowledge about that or information that they could provide uh, for the record of any other jurisdictions, whether it's in New York State um, or in any other state. Um, but there's been implementation issues and what those jurisdictions then have been able to do there. Do you want to jump in, Nora? Sure. I'll, I'll say we have spoken with um, Tacoma Park, Maryland is one that has had non-citizen voting for, I think, at least 20 years now. And that bill actually, or the way they do it, actually, it's for anybody, regardless of citizenship status, Intro 1867 just focuses on LPRs and those with work authorization. Um, they've, you know, put protections in place to make sure that um, voters are, you know, sort of clearly marked on the poll books, their registration forms, explain to people what their rights are. They give opt out, uh, you know, clauses and things like that in case somebody accidentally registered to, to vote in a uh, federal election and, you know, wasn't supposed to. Um, so they've, you know, figured out ways to put different safeguards in, um, different advocates and other, uh, you know, individuals supporting the bill. We have spoken with them just to learn a little bit more about what that implementation has looked like. And they told us that they've never had somebody uh, vote in a non-municipal election um, and vote, in, you know, in a, an election they were not qualified to, to do so for. Now, just from a legal question, um, like a jurisdictional question, Tacoma Park, um, and I, I'm sorry, I forgot the other um, municipalities that the public advocate mentioned, but um, those municipalities did this through through a local law or local ordinance down there. Um, and did they run into constitutional challenges um, from the Maryland state constitution? I mean, I'm not, I don't know if you're a, a, a state constitution uh, expert, but um, uh, I don't know if anyone can speak to kind of the constitutional issue that uh, Councilmember Yeager raised. Yeah, um, we have someone who uh, is on, they're going to be speaking, I guess, late in another panel. His name is Ron okay. Duck. He's been working on this issue extensively um, okay. and would be better suited to respond um, to the previous uh, uh, instances of municipal voting happening, um, mm -hmm. you know, the state constitution does not say non-citizens can't vote. Um, state election law allow local election law to be, to be inconsistent with state law. So there is that to be said as well. And there's precedent from um, earlier cases that have already happened. Um, so I don't, I don't for, see this as a issue against the state constitution. Uh, more so than having the will to get this bill done. Um, and I see the assemblywoman has joined to speak. Oh. Thank you. And, and I'll um, let the witness later out a little bit more, but I think one of the things that we all as legislators and those of us who are attorneys are very much aware of is that when it comes to preemption, we at the local level can always expand the rights, but never, uh, actually diminish the rights that whoever is above us, be it the state or the federal government is giving uh, in a particular re in, in a particular situation. And look, haven't actually been a drafter for the city council. I can tell you we often wrote bills that we weren't sure whether they were constitutional or not, but we knew that it was the right thing to do. So we would move them forward because it was the right thing to do. It isn't the job of council members. It isn't the job of the legislature to determine whether something who is perhaps an open question, constitutional or not. Arguably, I would say this is not an open question. There's been at least three holdings in the Court of Appeals and other courts in the state of New York, allowing municipalities to determine who can vote. But even if there was, 
let the courts decide. It is not our job as legislators to do that. It is not your job as legislators to do that. Let the courts decide. And so I'll, I'll leave it at that, but I, um, to, to uh, address uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Yeager, definitely, you know, given uh, our role in the state, we will absolutely be looking at this, but it shouldn't diminish what you guys guys need to do now. It shouldn't excuse what you guys need to do now. You guys can open the door so that the rest of the state can walk through it. I can and in also... fact, we do, we do have a bill here that, uh, that, we, that certainly we can, we can pass and we're, we're um, uh, meeting part of that, um, that process today here by hearing the bill in public. So, Chair, um, we can also Second. share our legal memo with you regarding this matter. Um, and we're happy to do that and also happy to announce that we are back to um, having a supermajority on the bill um, and with uh, public advocate Williams that brings us up to 35 co-sponsors with a new addition of uh, Councilwoman Dharma Diaz who's here earlier. Thank you for signing on to the bill. Um, do, does anyone know in, in other jurisdictions that have implemented non-citizen voting do non-citizens generally vote at similar rates as citizens do? I don't know if there's any um, analysis of that. I believe so. Um, but again, we can, we can circle back with that answer or you can okay. ask the following panel. Great. Um, and then, um, the, the, here's a here's a question. And I, this might be this is a question that I certainly will be asking the Board of Elections. But the Board of Elections obviously has made a, a, a number of high profile mistakes in the past few elections um, that have hampered the smooth administration of election. Um, uh, that's kind of an ongoing story there. Um, are you confident that they could administer a program like this successfully? Um, what resources or regulations or procedures do you propose to avoid Board of Election errors detrimental to running municipal voting, the a municipal voting program? Well, I don't think that we should prohibit um, or not ex restore the right of voting um, and bring in more people into our democracy because the Board of Elections generally tends to not do their job appropriately. So I think that there is uh, there's an opportunity to partner with the board, New York City Board of Elections to ensure that they run this program well. And I think that the advisory council and committee that would be chaired by the public advocate and in partnership with four other uh, organizations can help set up that system for the Board of Elections to ensure that they are able to uh, move this process forward in a seamless way. Yeah. Um, I mean, that might be something that um, if this bill were to pass that we could um, look to the state for some help in kind of the overall um, um, setup of, of the system and program and, uh, and uh, oversight and administration as well. So we can you know, make sure that there's the resources available and, um, um, and, uh, and that it, you know, that, that it not be subject to, I mean, one of the, one of the, um, one of the challenges that we've seen in New York City over the last um, five or six years in particular has been this kind of um, decrease in confidence in um, democracy because of mistakes at the Board of Elections. And so I agree with you, though, that um, we should not be um, letting uh, those concerns determine which which policies we pursue um, uh, just because. Uh, they have made mistakes does not mean that we should not be um, looking to expand the bandwidth. Uh, okay, so those are those are my questions for the panel at this point. Um, and um, I, I greatly appreciate everybody's um, uh, uh, patience and, uh, and the thoughtful testimony of this panel. Um, and with that, I will turn it back over to uh, the council committee, council committee. And I wanna thank you all. Thank you, assembly member. Um, for your testimony, and, and we look forward to, to working with you on the future as this bill hopefully moves forward. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll now turn it back to Council Member Rodriguez as the sponsor of Introduction 1867 to see if he has any questions. Council Member Rodriguez. 
luchar no solamente por nosotros. Tenemos que luchar por cada persona nuestra que llega a esta nación. No importa si vino en una visa, si vino con un permiso de trabajo, si vino en un green card, si cruzó por el río grande. Nosotros tenemos que entender que esta es la única nación que ha sido. De la generación de Council Member Rodriguez, did you have questions for this panel? We can go back to him if he uh, would like to raise his hand later. Um, at this point, I will now call on council members in the order they've used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you'd like to ask a question you've not yet raised your hand, please do so now. Okay, seeing no hands raised, um, we can now move on to the Board of Elections testimony, unless Chair Levin, you have any follow-up questions? Uh, no, I'm just seeing if, uh, if uh, Customer Rodriguez has questions, but um, he does not, then I am uh, happy to call on the next panel for testimony. We'll give him a minute. Okay, thank you. The next panel will consist of representatives from the New York City Board of Elections. Our panelists will include Executive Director Mike Ryan and Deputy Executive Director Don Sandow. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. Executive Director Ryan, Deputy Executive Director Sandow, please raise your right hand. I will read the oath once and call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Executive Director Ryan. Looks like the Board of Elections is on mute. Yes. Thank you. Deputy Executive, Executive Director Don Sando. Yes. Thank you. You may begin your testimony. Yes, uh, as I discussed uh, with uh, council staff, uh, we are preparing to testify uh, before the New York State Senate tomorrow. Uh, and we were not prepared to issue uh, remarks today, but we did make ourselves available uh, to answer any questions uh, that uh, the council may have uh, of the board. And, and as we also discussed, uh, if there are uh, questions that uh, come up for which we do not, do not have a response, as we do always, we are uh, prepared to issue written responses back to the council uh, at the conclusion of the formal hearing proceedings. Great, thank you. Um, at this point, I'll turn it over to Chair Levin for questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, so I'm gonna actually turn it over to uh, Council Member Rodriguez um, uh, who has questions right now and then I'll, I'll ask with you as well. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, in the past, uh, when we have uh, uh, the board election in front of us, and the question I've been asked uh, to the board election on this bill, 
And what the records say, and I personally has asked a question is that the board of election has said that it is not your job for you to decide, but that you have the capacity to execute a, the, the law if the council decided. What can you say about it? That remains our position. Uh, I think uh, the only thing uh, that has uh, somewhat changed is there appears to be a, a bit of a disagreement, a split, if you will, at the city government level, but that's not for us to resolve. I just would like to also remind the council as well uh, that should lawsuits arise, the New York City Board of Elections is represented by the New York City Law Department. So uh, with that structure in place, I stand by our previous comments to this, uh, to this council. Thank you. And, and, and that's, that's, I can, I, I would say that, I know that that's a, a position that, you know, that for us is important that even though we know that board election has been going through a lot of challenges and not only because of a internal issue of a thing where we believe that the board election can run and so better, but also because oh, we need to invest more resources and also we need to support the board election. I think it is important that the board election uh, is expressing that if uh, the, the council, if the city uh, uh, passed this bill, that there should not be any issue why the board election will not be ready to work with and, and, and put the system in place so that the new couple of 100,000 voters will be able to execute that right. Uh, can, have you looked at it in, uh, and, I, and I appreciate that position also, thanks for your leadership at the board election. Uh, do, do you think that, have you looked at the history of uh, New York City allowing a, a non-citizen to vote in local election? And it, when you have looked at it, what, can, what is your opinion about it? There are some uh, folks that still work here that were here when uh, non-citizens were permitted to vote, but that was limited to school board elections. This would be uh, a change uh, in that regard. And under those circumstances, uh, there was a side-by-side -side, uh, registration process. Uh, if you might recall the old buff cards, we call them buff cards, the registration cards. We call them buff cards because that was the color that the paper was printed on. It was called buff. It was like a light yellow. Um, and the school board elections were printed on blue paper uh, to differentiate uh, between uh, the two processes. Now, of course, there are challenges when you're maintaining two systems as opposed to one, uh, but it had been done before. And from an operational perspective, there is absolutely no reason to think that it cannot be done again. Uh, but just to be clear, laying to the side any legal questions uh, that may be up for public debate present. And, and, and of course, all the lawyers, and that could be a different interpretation that, you know, and hopefully, you know, we can arrive at the same uh, place uh, when it comes to what City Hall can talk about it, because it's not the first time that we end up having some difference. And, and at the end, we end it, uh, in the right uh, place that benefit everyone. How do you think that this law will expand voting rights? Well, there's really no way to tell. If, if a, a door gets open, you don't really know who's going to walk through it. Uh, now, it doesn't seem in some of the other jurisdictions where this uh, has occurred that it has been uh, widely uh, used, but ultimately that's not the question. The question is if someone ultimately has the right to do something, making that right available whether they choose to exercise the right is up to the individual. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. And, and I would like to just piggyback on one thing, uh, and Councilman, you've always been very uh, gracious uh, with the Board of Elections, but you hit the nail on the head. I heard some conversation uh, back and forth or some testimony about seeking state resources. Uh, we get some grant money from the state, but almost all of the dollars that we spend on elections in New York City come from uh, this body uh, and, uh, and from the administration. 
Uh, so you're right. If this is something that becomes a priority, it's going to be up to the city council uh, and the administration to properly fund it uh, so that the resources will be available. Well, thank you. And we definitely will be advocating for that. And also I would like to highlight that as we also heard from our representative at the, at the state level who joined us this morning, you know, we hope to pass this bill in New York City and to make New York City a role model, not only throughout the whole nation, but also throughout the whole state of New York. So let's continue working together. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Councilmember Rodriguez. Um, so I'm, uh, I do have questions, um, um, uh, Mr. Ryan and Ms. Sandow, so I will, I'll try to get them through them as quickly as possible, if, if that's okay. Um, so, uh, uh, Mr. Ryan, you, I'm sorry, you made reference to your previous remarks. What were those previous remarks? I, bit, I was reminded by Council uh, Member Rodriguez that we had previously testified, uh, and he was recounting back testimony that I had previously given. Uh, to say that I am uh, so, uh, so cognitively limber that I specifically remember the remarks, uh, no, okay. I don't. However, okay. uh, I accepted Council Member Rodriguez's representations in that regard. Okay. Uh, so I guess my first question is, would the Board of Elections in New York City be able to handle this, the, the provisions of this bill? So this, despite uh, public colloquy, we have yeah. handled a lot uh, in the last uh, year and a half in, in, uh, in particular uh, with respect to uh, the, um, the pandemic and all yeah. of the legislative changes that were made, uh, including remarkable expansion, maybe temporary, but in, in whatever it was, it happened, remarkable expansion of the absentee balloting uh, process. Uh, so. Yeah. But to put it into a little bit of a perspective, right now we have just shy of 5 million active voters. Okay. Uh, and then you add another 1.6 million on top of that, and that gives you the total number of registered voters. So if you limit this just to active voters and you got 100% participation from, the, from the, uh, this population, you would be talking about a 20% increase in the number of voters. And okay. nothing, nothing in elections happens in a vacuum. So you would be talking about the registration process, which is one thing. And yep. then the domino effect of everything else, the increase in the number of poll sites and the number of voters per election district and all of that uh, would happen, too. And right. we have Actually, I asked the previous panel what percentage we thought would increase. And, you know, so 20 so percent is your estimation. So. Well, that's the top number, and I will go back okay. to... I that's fair. Say, I mean, it's an estimation. It's not like, you know, sure. I, I'm not, not well, holding but, it. but it's not one that's done just by throwing darts in the dark. I'm mm -hmm. going back to a previous testimony where I was asked rightly by Speaker Johnson, what happens if everybody shows up? When we had been making estimates in previous elections, uh, and the answer, we, did, we didn't have a good answer in that moment, but that was three years ago now. And so that's what we have to plan for. What if everybody shows up? And if everybody sure. shows up, it's 900,000 by other people's numbers. Right. So, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not looking to like, this isn't like, no, know, no, I'm, I'm uh, just Board of Elections being a punching bag here. I just want to know, sure. do, do you think at this point that you would be able to, to implement the provisions of this legislation? That's all. So it always depends, right? The devil is in the details. What is the implementation time frame? Well, how much time do you think that you would need to implement the provisions of this legislation? The more, and maybe can you, can you explain the steps that would be required? The, the more lead time, the better, right? So uh, I understand that there is always a, a level of uh, legislative impatience that, you know, uh, legislatures want to strike when the moment is there, if they have something they want to pass. So ultimately, we are an administrative agency, a ministerial agency, and we will have to implement uh, whatever, um, whatever is passed. But I will say this, with something like this, it is incremental and evolutionary in this sense. There's a potential pool of 900,000 people. 
they're not all going to show up on day one and register. That will happen over the course of time, and we won't be uh, inundated in, in that sense with, with high numbers uh, in the beginning. And like everything else, it will give you uh, an, an opportunity uh, to grow into it if we see disproportionate levels of registration in specific neighborhoods, well, then we would probably come back not only to the city council, but to other community groups as well to uh, find uh, additional polling locations uh, and such, since all of it is intertwined. It's not just the, reg the registration piece uh, in some respects um, is, is an infrastructure that has to be built no matter what and will handle one or a million registrations. But it's, right. it's, the, it's the domino effect, as I said, that potentially could impact the remainder of the system uh, that I think would likely occur on an incremental basis as opposed to, a, a, you know, the dam bursting, so to speak, and a flood occur. Do you, do you anticipate... Um this bill requiring software updates and have you worked with the voting machine um, companies or any other systems um, or anything you would need from the state board of elections, any, any types of approvals or anything like that? Like, have you gone through like a logistical punch list mm -hmm. of like, or put together a logistical punch list of what would be required? We have uh, a preliminary understanding of what the immediate needs would be. Uh, I'm not anticipating on the uh, election day side or election now 10 day side uh, that there would be any real issues with the voting machines themselves, because once the person gets a ballot, the ballot has to work in the system and we can't issue a ballot that doesn't uh, mm -hmm. that doesn't work. Right. So it would be limited to the number uh, of the city contests. So. With all of the changes that are being made, whether it be ranked choice voting or, uh, or a change like this, uh, you're increasing uh, the likelihood that there would be um, multiple page ballots. Uh, because for city contests uh, in a regular election, we would be able to mix the city contests with state and federal contests. Right. If we're going to have city contests where non-citizens can vote and they cannot vote in those other contests. They'd have to be and we would have to have a separate page just for those contests. And then we would likely, for the purposes of the uh, Equal Protection Clause, since it, it applies across the board, we would likely then have to, to give out a city ballot to everyone in addition to the, uh, the state and federal ballot. So you're now talking about likely a two page at minimum two page ballot for all contests uh, in 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 New York City where city offices are implicated. Presumably you would you would give uh, a two page ballot with kind of sequestered ballots with on the one on the one side city and on the other side state. Um, uh, no, uh, these would have to be uh, separate uh, sheets of paper. That's what I mean. That's what, that's what right. I mean. It's a question. They, they'd be different. Yep. They'd be different okay, sheets right. of paper. And you would have to give the, the same sheets language. of paper to, 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 to people that, that would vote in both, right? So, yes. So, it would be, it would, it, that would apply to everybody. So, it would be a change in the way that, that the Board of Elections writes up its, uh, its ballots because as it, as it is right now, they can be mixed together on a single page because uh, because the same requirements are for both con both types of contests. Yes, correct? but, it, but yeah, it also yeah. will fundamentally change the conduct of elections because candidates for various offices who officially or unofficially run as slates will not be on the same piece of paper anymore. So if, yeah, you the, wanted, okay. if you wanted to marry up your campaign with your local assembly person or your local senator, uh, they're going to be on one page and you're I mean, going to be on another. It's infrequent. I mean, the, the, the amount of times when you have a congressional or state office uh, during um, uh, an assembly or a Senate office during a municipal election 
is if there's a special election, but it's not an on-year election. I mean, you, you, your, your congressional and your state offices, uh, regular elections are on, the, on even years. Your, your, your city elections are on, on odd years. Again, that's not, that's not with right. notwithstanding uh, specials. And then, of course, the district attorneys on the odd years. I get it. Right. Um, and party um, positions as well. And party positions. Um, do um, our party positions, is, is there, a, I don't necessarily want to go down that rabbit hole, but is there, is there any provision among state law that party positions cannot be voted on by non-citizens? Again, we're not, uh, we're not prepared to speak to the legality of it. Okay, uh, it's not really in the purview we'll of this hearing, to, so we'll let's leave it. Let's other. leave it aside. Let's leave it aside because it's not really in the purview of this bill. Um, uh, this bill would increase the number of voters, as you as you mentioned, um, and you have to anticipate, um, you know, one hundred percent of those new voters being able to vote, um, uh, actually casting votes. What is the have you examined like what the budgetary impact to the city board of elections would be uh, both in a kind of one shot uh, framework and then for a an ongoing um, budgetary impact Have you kind of uh, uh, estimated what the budget impact would be here. Uh, given the notice uh, that we received for this hearing, we did not do a deep dive into dollars, but there, there's always a dollar implication. There's no question about that. I think if we move forward, we, I would encourage, I mean, I, I, you, you would have to work with the council finance division because there'll be a fiscal impact. So, um, so I would encourage you to, um, you know, respond to their questions if they start reaching out to you guys about. Um, right. So, um, so there's the one shot. We have to do a budget, a budget impact, there's, a fiscal impact. It's the case. single shot, right? If, if we have, we, and we will have to, uh, we would have to make modifications to the registration process. That's a that's a, a one off one time expense. Uh, but then uh, there will be also ongoing uh, expenses associated with uh, additional uh, polling locations, additional poll workers and all of that. If we get a substantial uh, increase uh, in uh, participation. But that happens. On a rolling basis, so we negotiate our budget uh, every year and it depends on the number of contests uh, for that year. And then always the wild card is whether a special or specials uh, get thrown into mm -hmm. the mix. So I forgot about judges. There's, there's, there's judicial elections as well. And those will happen right. on even and odd year. Um, uh, let me ask about um, with so are there, under what circumstances and with which entities does the Board of Elections now share voter roll information? And um, would this need to change if this bill were enacted? And, um, and then would it be possible for the Department, for the Board of Elections to uh, release voter rolls uh, if this bill were, were uh, enacted without revealing which voters are United States citizens and which voters are not. So all voter information, as the present status of the law is, uh, is public information. The only <clears throat> thing that we are legally permitted to shield from public view are uh, the last four digits of the Social Security number of a voter, the non-driver or driver ID number from the New York State Department of Motor Vehicles. And because the, the state of the law is so up to date, we are not allowed to uh, reveal a fax number. There you go. Okay. Those, those three items are the only items that we're able to uh, shield. Other very than important, the fax number. Yeah, got it. Very yeah. important fax number we can't give out. Uh, yeah. And we've had conversations uh, with state officials and, you know, uh, regarding uh, email addresses and cell phones and things like that. Uh, but right now, those are not subject uh, to exemption. They would have to be turned over as well. So anyone can request all, uh, you know, 4.9 plus 1.6 or 5 point almost 6 million voters and get all of that information. But would you be able to? Would you be able to um, 
you know, create a system that would be able to share that type of information, but not share uh, citizenship status or not share that it's a municipal voter and not somebody that's eligible then for um, state office. Again, I don't I don't want to get into uh, legalities and what laws are applicable or not applicable. All I can say to you is presently. The law only allows us to shield three pieces of information, which I've already uh, stated into the right. But, but for a practical on a practical level, you are able to shield some information, including the uh, all important facts number and, and, and the social Correct. security so, number. Et so, for example, if I went on to my uh, PC and I looked up a voter uh, record because I'm an elections official, I would get the full record. If you came into our offices here and went to our, one of our public terminals, you would yep. get all yep. the information except those three pieces of information that I state. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Councilor Rodriguez. I think he has a few questions as well. And then I might ask a couple more and, uh, and call on other members of the committee to ask questions. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, look, I, I, I'm very comfortable it, it, as I hear uh, the board election in previous hearing and today saying, our job is, is to execute. It's not our job to make the law. And I think that this doesn't have, you know, the decision of passing this bill to restore the municipal voting rights is based about the merit. No one has a question how much the, those uh, uh, immigrants contribute and sacrifice themselves during COVID when a lot of people went to the hometown and to the Hudson Valley and they stay here working in the daily, the supermarket, the pharmacy as the first responder. So I think that it, it, I would like to take my approach that whatever dollars that had to be invest, whatever investment had to be made on the tech piece, that's I will leave it to us as a council and the, and the mayor to deal with that. This is about the right. And, and I, I think that, you know, one thing that I also want to say is that, you know, no one is a judge uh, uh, in any of those entities uh, to decide, you know, if we pass a bill. Uh, it's all about us at the council to decide. And I don't think that, again, like, you know, having so many leaders that share similar ideology. You know, I mentioned it, all the borough president. There's only one borough president that has not signed, the one from Staten Island. But all the board president for the other four boroughs, they have shown the support. So I think that, you know, this is something that uh, 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 we need to do our job. And as usually if there's any challenge, we let the court to do their job too. We know we can make this change. Like we did the, the run choice voting. And, and there's already a separate New York City ballot. It, 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 only in unique circumstances, there's any ballot that uh, bring together a border, uh, the right, a uh, border, a uh, ballot in front of them uh, for a state or the city uh, position. So uh, again, I'm happy that you and the rest of the team in the board election are saying we are ready, ready to do the job if you guys pass this bill and work with, this, with the city. And that's what we're intended to do as we already have the veto power. And we also have Dharma Diaz who signed today as the last council member so now we have 34 council members that are on, on behalf of this bill behind a citywide vast majority coalition that we have never seen before. Thank you. For the Board of Elections. Chair, I believe you were on mute for the beginning of that question. Oh. Sorry, uh, do any other, sorry, do any other uh, council members have questions for the Board of Elections? Chair, I see Council Member Yeager's hand is raised. Council Member Yeager for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Ryan, just want to clarify something. When you say the law allows uh, the board to shield certain information from release, information contained on voter registration cards, uh, is that the New York City Administrative Code? No, that would be the New York State Election Law. New York State Election Law. So if the city council were to pass a law that said that there was additional information you could not release, say an address, 
would you be allowed to comply with that law? My understanding is no, uh, but I also understand that there is quite a bit of uh, back and forth, but that should be something that would be remedied uh, or reconciled uh, somehow between the state uh, and the city. Okay, and is, is the reason for that because of the concept known as preemption where the state has acted on a particular topic, we are barred from acting as a city? Well, yes, I have cited that uh, that uh, aspect of the law quite frequently uh, in the eight years that I've been here. Uh, so yes, preemption is ever present and is an umbrella over uh, everything uh, that the, uh, the, the city board or any board of elections. So if we, for example, determined that we were gonna have early voting start, say 45 days before an election and mandate that the city board uh, open up poll sites for 45 days before the election for 14 hours a day, you would look at us and tell us that we would be acting contrary to state law. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I think we're done. Thank you very much, Mr. Ryan. It's really good to see you again. Yes. Nice to see you as well. And uh, you and uh, and everyone else uh, who, who shares your faith, La uh, Shana Tuva. You? Amen. Thank you. And, and good to see you looking healthy and being back up there. Well, this is my this is my first hearing back. So, it's a, you know, the cobwebs are, you know, coming off, but I, I think we're doing OK. We're in good hands. Thank you very much. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Ryan, does does um, does the does the Board of Elections currently um, keep track of a uh, a voter's citizenship status? Yes. Because it's it's de facto, uh, because right. first of all, you have to check the box on the voter registration form. Right. So but if, but if but it, well, I guess my my question would be then if it's de facto because only citizens are allowed to vote. But if you were to allow non-citizens to vote, um, there is no uh, would there is there state law governing uh whether or any any uh, new information, in other words, the state does not speak to uh, um, if if we were to expand voting. Like so, for example, let me let me put it this way: um, was there a was there a when they did when they did school board elections uh, on the blue cards? Did uh, did they keep? Was there a question asked about citizenship status? Um I don't, I don't recall, but it was a separate, it was a completely separate form. Uh, and those, those records were kept uh, separately. Well, let me put it, this, okay, so if, if, if you were, let me, okay, so let me ask the question this way. If you were to uh, uh, implement this bill, um, is there any requirement, does the state law speak to uh, any requirement of the Board of Elections to um, uh, denote somebody's citizenship status. Yes, because presently under New York state law, we have to utilize a New York state voter registration form, which asks the citizenship question. Now, you don't have to actually use the form, but you have to include all of the information on the form. So if for some reason, a voter wanted to fill out, write it out in longhand. It would still have to contain all of the information contained on the state board of elections approved form. And a question is, I am a citizen of the United States. So then when I look up, I go to the, the public terminal at the board of elections and I look up a, someone's voter information, their citizenship status will be affirmative on that on, on, in those terminals. Is that, is that correct? Is that what you're saying? If not on the data screen, because I don't sit at the public screen very often, if not on the data screen, certainly on the uh, the uh, the copy of the voter registration form, which okay somebody could is also publicly accessible. Right. It's publicly okay. accessible, whether it's on that data screen or not. I, I don't know off the top yeah. of my head. It's on the okay. data screen that I see, but I can't see. Right. I haven't sat at a public terminal to look it up. It's not something that can be withheld by the Board of Elections. You mentioned those, the, the fax number, 
no. So what happens is the system is programmed when we're printing something to delete that information. To delete what information? The, those the, the three, fax number. Those, yeah, the fax number, the, the, the social, and the non-driver or driver ID number. But it does not delete the, the uh, citizenship question. No, because what will happen is when, when a campaign goes, we'll see it more frequently used in challenges to petitions. And one of the things that campaigns use when they do challenges to petitions are copies of the voter registration uh, forms so that they can mm -hmm. check the signature to see if somebody uh, is eligible uh, to vote. Does the signature match? Does it not match? And the, and the, and the, and in, in on those forms, the last four of the social gets redacted when a when a uh, campaign asks for the copy of the buff card. Correct. And that certainly ha that happens as a matter of course without without any question. It's built into the system now. Okay. Um, okay. Um, If this bill were enacted, what would happen if a poll worker mistakenly gave a municipal voter a ballot with a state or federal race on it? Would anything prevent the voter from filling out or scanning the incorrect ballot? No. Now, for, uh, for early voting, where we use a ballot on demand system, the uh, likelihood of that occurring is uh, much further down the road. It probably would, wouldn't happen under those circumstances. But in paper ballot situations at a busy poll site, if somebody gave the wrong ballot, it would be akin mm -hmm. to, say, a primary election where uh, if a poll worker mistakenly gave a Republican a Democratic ballot or a Democrat a Republican ballot, nothing in the system would stop that ballot from being cast. And once cast, cannot be backed out. Okay, so then what remedies would the Board of Elections put into place, should a municipal voter fill out and scan the wrong ballot by mistake and subsequently realize that they needed to void the ballot? You're saying nothing can be done? Once the ballot is accepted into the scanner, nothing can be done. That realization would have to be made prior. And then if it was made prior, then they would follow the void ballot uh, processes that are already uh, in existence at the polls. And what would happen if a non-citizen voter mistakenly attempted to vote in an election where there were no local races on the ballot? So say on an even year election, no city races on the ballot, would the poll worker be able to identify that the individual is registered as a non-citizen voter? So um, we're taking a leap of faith here that this already happened, right? But we now have... Uh, electronic poll books. But if we didn't have electronic poll books, let's say even in the old paper poll book days, this is more akin to primary elections, right? Because mm -hmm. often in this city, you'll have Democratic primaries in areas where you don't have uh, Republican primaries, right? So if you're not an eligible voter for that contest, your name will not appear in the poll list book, whether it be a paper book or whether it's the electronic electronic poll books now. We don't just distribute an, an entire unfettered list of voters. Only eligible voters' uh, names appear in the poll list book for a given contest. It could cause um, confusion, as it does in primary elections, where people insist that they're registered and that they should be able to vote, uh, right. when in fact they may not be eligible for that contest. But that confusion uh, is not the same as them appearing in a poll list book and getting a ballot when they should. Now, is there a, what's a pen, what's the penalty if a registered Republican um, is given a Democratic primary ballot and votes in a Democratic primary? Is there a, a penalty to that voter? Or are they um, guilty of some criminal offense? No, I mean, if, if, if it's a simple mistake and somebody makes an honest error, uh, then uh, no problem. Uh, if, okay. Would that say? Would that apply then? If if a if a someone that's a municipal non-citizen voter uh, voted 
in a state election that they were not entitled to vote in, would that same perspective apply then? Or would they be guilty of some, or would they be, you know, liable for some criminal statute? When it, when it comes to uh, the board of elections, there's no penalty. Uh, honest mistakes happen. No election is, is perfect. Uh, but I can't speak to what other implications uh, there, there might be. Uh, we have had in the past inquiries uh, from various uh, federal entities uh, regarding non-citizens uh, voting uh, in, in elections or representing under those circumstances, representing that they were citizens in order to be in order to become voters in the first place. Is that a, a um, is there any state law to that effect or is this purely federal law? Uh, well, it's, in order to register to vote in New York state, you have to be a citizen. So you don't get on the voter rolls unless you are a a citizen or B made some misrepresentation uh, that later turns out not to be true in order to get yourself uh, registered to vote. If this law bill went into effect as law, that would obviously change that. Well, I think uh, council member, that's where uh, the rubber meets the road. Uh, and that's, what I was discussing earlier, there seems to be a split between the administration and the city council on the legality of it. And uh, although we haven't been briefed on the law department's uh, position, uh, they seem to have one. Uh, as it came out over the weekend, uh, I was a little bit surprised, quite frankly, uh, that uh, that was made uh, public uh, and, and not told to uh, perhaps the most important entity uh, that it would need to be told. Uh, but that's a conversation for another day and in another setting. Um, okay, so I am going to uh, ask my colleagues once more if they have any questions. Chair, Council Member Yeager has his hand up. Councilor Yeager. Thank you. Uh, just just real quickly to the chair's question. Uh, illegal voting in New York is, is not a status crime. It requires knowledge and willfulness. So uh, if somebody uh, accidentally casts the wrong ballot, uh, it's not per se a crime. Um, but if they willfully show up at a poll site and uh, they're not entitled to vote and it's done with knowledge and willfulness, it is a crime. Um, but just to to the board, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the gentleman's first question in this round was uh, a question about whether or not there is currently a law in New York uh, with regard to um, mandating or not mandating the disclosure of the question of citizenship and whether or not the law speaks to it, I think. And, you know, I see the chairs not, not, you're nodding your head or you're shaking your head. No, I'm, no, 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 neither, okay. neither. I'm, I'm reading something. Don't worry about it. Okay, I, I don't want to make this characterize uh, the gentleman's question, but th again, I'm going to refer back to what I referred to earlier. Uh, it is not a statute. It is the Constitution of the State of New York, Article 2, Section 1, and it's in the first two words, every citizen, immediately followed by the words, shall be entitled to vote at every election for all officers elected by the people. This is not a question of semantics or what does a word mean or let's roll the dice or let's see what the law department feels about it. This is a question of nothing because the words are there and it's in the constitution. So again, you know, all these questions to the board and, and the executive director of being the expert that he is, is able to answer most of them. Um, but again, you know, the, the board doesn't defend itself in lawsuits, the city law department does. The question again is not a question. It's very strict. It's, it's very straightforward in the constitution of the, of the state of New York. And the simplest way to do this is for the state legislature to address this question instead of having it in our body, much like it wouldn't be proper for the Department of Sanitation to, uh, to, to propose rules regarding uh, 
uh, the building of a building, because that's something that the Department of Buildings proposes rules about. It's the, literally the same topic. So with that, again, uh, it's not a question to the board, but I do turn it back. Thank you very much. But, uh, and Council, yes. uh, Council yes. Member Yeager, uh, we did check, um, and the citizenship question appears on that screen uh, that you can, uh, you can view, and your answer to that question is, is visible uh, to the public uh, presently. And if, and if I could just, and maybe it's just because of what I've been through, uh, recently, but if I can just piggyback on something uh, that, that you said, I would like to recommend moving forward to everyone that the state legislature and the city council can work more closely and more effectively when working hand in glove so that there isn't a tug of war in which the Board of Elections becomes the rope that invariably will split down the middle. Uh, and it puts us in a, a difficult uh, position quite regularly, and it's, it's not comfortable. I respect the institutions of the city and, the, and of the state, and I respect the individuals that serve. Whether I agree with them or disagree with them on a particular issue often isn't even the case for me, because ultimately we have to follow whatever rules are set. But I, I just wish that with these issues of importance and voter rights are so important that we just work together and work together for the city of, uh, uh, of the citizens of the city of New York. Uh, and then we can stop all of this. And then it becomes a much easier process to deal with. So I, I'll try not to break my ankle jumping down off my soapbox, but uh, I, it's, it's a plea. It really is just a plea at this point to, to mm -hmm. let's work together and stop all of this rancor back and forth, and not necessarily on this particular issue, but just in general. So this is a very unrancorous uh, hearing, so and that's the way I intend to keep it. Um, and with that, Mr. Ryan, I'm going to turn it back over to the uh, uh, bill sponsor, um, uh, Councilmember Rodriguez, for questions. Time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And and as you know, you and I have worked in many other initiatives. In bills where uh, uh, we were told that we were not allowed, we we're not supposed to do it, but we figure out that it, 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 how to do it. And this is one of those. And I agree with the board, New York City Board of Election. I think that, you know, this is about us to figure out as the legislators to play our role. We are not judge. It, it, if there's any challenge for a something that we believe that you know, the federal law already said that the state and the city decide, are the one had to the right to decide who vote in the state and the municipal election. We need to do our job. If it's a good thing to expand voting rights, to expand democracy, and then we let the court to do the job. We know that the immigration coalition is surrounded by, and, and the members of more than 65 citywide institutions that cannot be run, as I say. You know, we need to revise, like, as I, you know, I want to remind everyone, this is supported by the New York State NWACP, by the House of Justice, by the voting power, veto power members number that we have at the council. So there has to be something right and something that makes sense and something that is legal, something that has been revised, something that has been discussed by the coalition with many lawyers from the council, from the uh, different party to arrive where we are today. But let's be clear. Some of the opposition is based on racism. It's based about some people that they don't get it. That New York City today is not the same New York City that we have in 1900 when the population used to be made by 93% white, 2% black, Latino were in a country. Like there's, I'm one of those recent immigrants. And I feel that again that, again, a lot of the things that we've been addressing as the board election has said, you know, it's not for them to respond to the legality but it's for us to work together as a legislator. However, I want to, you know, to bring to the attention to the board election is a question. Have you looked at the city of Tacoma Park in Maryland and how they have been implementing this uh, law since 1990s and how they have not have any of the issues that have been addressed by some of the people who are making any case on opposition 
on how to organize, how to have a separate, separate ballot, how to be careful that, that a non-citizen doesn't vote in the other federal or the state elections. Have you by any chance look at that election at city of Tacoma Park in Maryland that have been implementing non-citizen vote since 1990s? As I said, we have, uh, this came to us kind of, Kind of late. We haven't done a deep dive. Uh, the only thing that I know about Tacoma Park uh, is the present population is under 20,000. Uh, and, and so I don't know uh, how many of the 20,000 residents of Tacoma Park fall into the category. And we haven't had an opportunity uh, to uh, pick up the phone and call them. Uh, but I would suspect that like we did uh, with early voting uh, when the state passed it, uh, if this were implemented, we would reach out to other jurisdictions like like we did to states that had uh, implemented early voting and get the benefit of their uh, of their knowledge uh, and their experience on, on dealing with this, uh, you know, for a long term uh, as a long term issue. And, and 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 if you can answer the question, fine. If you prefer not to answer, uh, I'm fine, too, because of the role that you're playing. You have to be sure that you send a message to everyone that the board election is ready to execute. And if we decide to work on to pass this bill, and this is something that we need to work uh, between all the council that with the number that we had, the veto power and city hall and everyone that had to do this job from this side. Uh, but, it, you know, with Jerry uh, Batamala, staff attorney, for the Asian American League of Defense and Education and Foreign, a made a made, made an argument, a, a, a had made an argument saying that a New York State Constitution established a baseline or floor, not a ceiling. So for anyone that wants to bring any issue, basically because they want to be voting against this bill, if we move forward. So, but if we want to look at the New York State, New York State Constitution, the New York State Constitution, what the New York State Constitution does is that it establishes a baseline, not a ceiling. It doesn't say that non-citizen cannot vote, only that citizen can, but that's not a prohibition, prohibition for a non-citizen voting. So if you would like to, you know, if you have anything to add on what the New York State, State Constitution say, more than happy to hear, but right. if not, I just wanted to um, be clear right. for any colleague that is making any arguments about the right that we have at the city to vote on this bill. So, so I would say this, we have gone through as a state uh, an unprecedented time of changes and uh, to the elections process. Uh, we, got, we got hit with a lot of uh, New York state election law changes. Uh, and in the lead up to those changes, there was disagreement on what was appropriate and what was inappropriate. And we did uh, then what we're doing now, which is to say, there are always going to be implementation challenges. Let the period of disagreement come to a period of agreement. And once there's a finished product, and there's a spe specified set of rules that we have to follow. We will do our very best uh, to follow those rules as, as they say. And, and it's really not for us to get involved in the uh, small p uh, political uh, back and forth uh, of these issues. You guys come to us with a finished product uh, and it's all good and legal. We're ready to go. Thank you. That's actually very, it's a, that's, that's very helpful to know. So I, I, uh, I, I'm going to uh, have that last statement be my takeaway from the Board of Elections. Um, okay, uh, that's all I got uh, for the Board of Elections. Uh, any other council members going once, going twice? Okay, we'll let our colleagues from the Board of Elections get back to doing their jobs and um, uh, we'll call on the administration uh, for testimony now. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The next panel will consist of representatives from the administration. 
From the Mayor's Democracy NYC Initiative, Chief Democracy Officer Laura Wood will be providing testimony. From the Mayor's Office of Immigration Affairs, Commissioner Raquel Batista and Eileen Reyes Arias will be available to answer questions. And from the Mayor's Office of City Legislative Affairs, testimony will be provided by Director Paul Ochoa. I will now administer. Go ahead, Council. Council, thank you. Okay. I will now administer the oath. Chief Democracy Officer Wood, Commissioner Batista, Director Reyes Arias, Director Ochoa, please raise your right hand. I will read the oath once and then call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Chief Democracy Officer Wood. I do. Thank you. Commissioner Batista. I do. Thank you. Director Reyes Arias. Director. She's, she's logging on now. Okay. We'll come back to her. Uh, Director Ochoa. Director Ochoa. I do. Thank you. Do we have um, Eileen Reyes Arias on? That's okay. If she comes elsewhere and later, uh, Chief Democracy Officer Wood, you may begin your testimony now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to Acting Chair Levin, to Chair Cabrera, and all the members of the Government Operations Committee for calling this hearing. My name is Laura Wood. I'm the Chief Democracy Officer at Democracy NYC. Very much appreciate your holding this hearing today and for the opportunity to provide testimony. And thank you so much to the staff and the advocates who helped work to make this happen. With so much focus on local elections this year, we really appreciate the council's uh, calling a hearing on this important topic. And, and as I think has been mentioned earlier, if intro 1867 becomes law, New York will be the first large city, the largest city in the US to allow non-citizens to vote in, in municipal elections. As I think members of the committee know, Democracy NYC and the administration have worked hard over the past several years to push for increased civic participation and to make the process of voting easier and more accessible. Uh, and, and I will just note that the June primary we, we just had was nothing short of historic with over 350 candidates on the ballot competitive municipal elections across the city and, of course, the first ever citywide election with this new system of ranked choice voting. Our, our work um, this past spring was bolstered by an unprecedented investment of $15 million to inform all New Yorkers about the new system of voting ahead of the June primary, and I, and I think a lot of that was some was was work that was done at the behest of the council. So we very much appreciated your support and encouragement in that effort. This included a citywide advertising campaign in 25 languages, investments in language access and accessibility resources, and direct outreach with community groups, faith-based organizations, minority and women-owned businesses, and many other stakeholders. Um, our media placement vendor for that campaign estimated that we reached over 90% of New Yorkers with ads in 25 different languages. And I, I mention this because we recognize that immigrants make up an, a critical, crucial part of New York City. And we agree wholeheartedly with many of the sentiments that have been expressed here today. And while we understand and appreciate the goals of the bill, we do have some concerns about it. Um, ultimately, it is these questions that mean that the city is not taking a position on the bill at this time. Specifically, intro 1867, as written, raises some legal questions that require careful review. For example, 
Article two, section one of the New York State Constitution provides that, quote, citizens have the right to vote in New York State. This provisions terms apply to our local offices through Article nine of the New York State Constitution, which require local elective officers to be elected by persons entitled to vote as provided in section one of Article two of the Constitution. We believe that review of these issues with the city's lawyers and council legal staff is appropriate to ensure a shared understanding of the legal context. In addition, and as the mayor and my office have said publicly repeatedly, the Board of Elections is in urgent need of reform. And allocating responsibility for non-citizen voting to an institution that is unreliable and unaccountable raises serious concerns, especially as it relates to privacy, discrimination, and legal consequences. Non-citizens who vote in federal elections, even inadvertently, can face severe criminal and immigration consequences. We simply do not feel confident today that the Board of Elections would be able to minimize the risk of error in this context. While the city does not take a position on intro 1867 at this time, we do believe that non-citizen voting is absolutely an issue that must continue to be explored. And, and again, we think many, many good points have been raised already today and I'm sure will be raised later. Um, this is an issue that is, is publicly before the Racial Justice Commission and conversations are continuing citywide. So, so once again, we thank the chair of the committee and the members for participating in the hearing and we look forward to hearing more throughout, throughout the day and answering any questions you might have on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Director Paula Choa. Okay. Uh, good afternoon now, uh, uh, Chair Levin, uh, Chair Cabrera, members of the committee. Uh, I'm Paula Choa, Director of the Mayor's Office of City Legislative Affairs. I'm here to discuss intro uh, 2316 by Councilmember Salamanca. As you know, one of the roles of the Office of City Legislative Affairs is to ensure that the administration is prepared to testify at all relevant council hearings. We take this responsibility incredibly seriously and we pride ourselves in having great relationship with all the chairs of the 30 plus committees at the city council. Um, every time there's a committee hearing, either in person or virtual, we always have people watching and taking notes in order for the administration to follow up with the relevant chairs if there's an issue that uh, raised that merits formal response. In fact, if there was a special request as there was today, letting members of the public testify first, we coordinate with the chairs and committee staff in order to accommodate these special circumstances. Into, excuse me, intro uh, 2316 would mandate by law that an officer or employee of the city age of the city uh, must be in attendance for the entirety of the hearing to listen to all questions and testimony presented at the hearing. Well, we of course support the idea of having members of the administration stay for the whole hearing, as we always do, legislating this would set a difficult precedent to meet without much impact to the public. As I mentioned at the beginning of the testimony, we are always happy to coordinate with the relevant chairs in order, in order to ensure that the city, um, that the council and the public both feel like they're being listened to by administration officials at council hearings. With that, I am now happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Chair Levin, I'll now turn it to you for questions. Do we have any other uh, members of the administration testifying? The Mayor's Office of Immigration Affairs will be available for uh, Q&A. Oh, okay. Um, okay, uh, let me uh, turn it over to my colleagues if they have any questions. Chair, I see Councilmember Rodriguez and Cecil Morris. Councilmember Rodriguez, two questions? Stops now. I'm so disappointed that City Hall is not testifying in favor of this bill especially 
when we have leaders that promote the expansion of democracy to come here to say that we still need more time to talk about it. I hope that the team has done the homework when this bill was introduced on the council member John, on the speaker, Christine Quinn, the bill that also been revised on the council member, Margaret Chang, a bill that we have been working for years. And I mean, administration that has a couple of weeks left to come here with the opportunity that they have to leave a legacy, a mayor that being progressive in many areas. Don't come and tell me everything that we have done for immigrants. Because what I can tell you is that the shooting that happened in Washington night in the Bronx, in Brooklyn, mainly affect people of color. And in many of those communities, some people, they don't have a voice to elect their mayor, to elect the public advocate, to elect the council member. Yet because we as a city has decided that this city has changed the color of the skin of people coming to this city, then we change it. Who will be voting in this city? So this is my first thing and disappointing here from those have been testifying, still asking for more time or asking the legal part. No one here is a judge. The major is not a judge. Immigration Coalition has a great team of lawyers and they've been meeting with the council. They've been meeting with city hall and they've been able to make the case, this is legal, we can do it. As I said before, we have to remember that what we have in the New York State Constitution is a baseline or a floor, not a ceiling. Is that something that we agree with, City Hall? House member, I believe we lost your audio here. Is that something that we can agree with City Hall that the New York State Constitution, when it comes to the to this to, to this matter, only has established a baseline or a floor and not a ceiling? I can take it. I think Laura is on mute. Um, Council Member, we're not ready to discuss uh, legal uh, concerns at a public hearing, but we're happy to brief you. Uh, privately with you and the members of the um, staff uh, as you deem fit. This is not a staff, a, a director or legislation. This is, not a, this is about City Hall had decided to make it public. Let's make it public. New York State Constitution has established that on this issue, there's a baseline and there's a floor and there's not a ceiling. He had decided that citizen that, that the, city had, the citizens had the right to vote. It doesn't say that non-citizen immigrant with working papers and green card cannot have the right to vote. Again, council member, I completely understand your position. I'm happy to have a discussion with you and the lawyers um, in a non-public setting. As you know, we tend not to discuss legal matters in public settings, but we're happy to do that for you. And anyone and any other council member for that matter. I had taken a lot of heat working with this administration because I believe in the progressive cause that this mayor stand for. And when a lot of people say that we should not close like a signing, I say let's do it. And we were told that we couldn't do it. When we talk about pace expansion of the basic day, we were told that we couldn't do it maternity leave, UPK for all. The only reason someone can be behind trying to stop this movement that already started in Maryland. And please, no one bring any question or excuses about what can happen if someone is a citizen and a, a non-citizen go and vote and get the right, the wrong, the wrong ballot. Don't bring that. 
If you want to learn, go to Maryland. You will hear from them directly. The city of Tacoma Park that have been working, allowing non-citizens to vote since 1990. And if they can do in Maryland, we saying that we cannot do in New York City. Look at the faces of all those leaders here that are the ones that put their body working for immigrant rights. They will do the job to educate the voters, knowing who had the right to vote, how to navigate the process. This is about being a role model for the nation when the right wing in the South and the Midwest and some of those voices here in the city try to stop voting rights. We have that opportunity here. So Laura, from the Chief Democracy Office perspective, have you looked on how the New York State Constitution only has established a base line and a floor and not a ceiling? She's, she's muted. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I was not able to unmute myself. Thank you so much, Council Rodriguez. I know I, I, you know, I hear the passion in your voice, and I so appreciate your advocacy on behalf of all New Yorkers. Um, the as I as I explained in my testimony, the, the legal question has to do with the fact that the word citizen is actually used in the in the New York State Constitution, um, specifically as a to the right to vote. Um, and that is precisely, I, I don't know if you would call that a ceiling or a baseline, but that's, that's precisely the question that I think we feel needs to be worked out, um, yeah, you know, as a preliminary matter to, uh, to, to ensuring that, that this could, could actually happen with, and be on solid legal footing. I, I, again, I, I have a lot of respect for all of you as individuals. So, and we know that we have worked with many issues and we know that we have been at some point, not necessarily, you know, in the same pace at some point, by the end of the day, this is about continuing the debate. And I hope again, that this is something that we can work it out. This is, a, this can be the, this is the only thing that I can do in my life from the being in government that will be, because this is about me. This is about coming here, living a green car from 83 to 2000, as I shared before, you know, as, as I shoot my, myself back there, that's who I am. And when I was a student activist, I was told that I could not be part of the movement and persuade Mario Cuomo not to increase tuition and cut the budget. And we won the battle. And we were told that we should not be able to stop the police abusing the underserved community. And we work in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. And we've been able working with the administration to see criminal justice reform. So my passion is because I'm one of those close to 1 million New Yorkers. I was there in the street when a lot of people moved to the Hobson Valley, when they moved to the Hampton, when they live in a 5,000 square feet. And I was there living in the underserved community in Northern Manhattan, where people live in a three generation children, parents, grandparents, I saw my people, Black, Latino, and Asian, the poorest one, dying in larger number because they didn't have the resources, because they were dealing with pre-health condition. So let's not deny a right of someone that has been they paying their taxes. So I just hope again that you know, like let's le let's leave the the role of the judge to do the job. Let's do our job as legislators. We have great lawyers with the Immigration Coalition and their team. And I hope that we have in veto power. We have in four borough presidents, except the one from Staten Island supporting this bill. Having the controller and the hopefully new controller, having the statement that you could see is public by the new hopefully mayor, we would do it, but this is our time to do it together. And council member, I just wanna acknowledge your partnership and advocacy on all the things that you mentioned. We of course agree with you and we've been side by side with working with you on, on all the things you mentioned that we've done for frontline workers, uh, anything, everything from you know providing legal services uh, to undocumented immigrants uh, to 
uh, fighting, uh, helping them fight in court on tenants. So we really appreciate your advocacy for that as well. Okay. Um, any other colleagues questions for the administration? Not seeing any hands raised, Chair. Excuse me? No, 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 oh, no one no, member has a okay. Um, okay, uh, this question is, I, I have a few questions um, for uh, Chief Democracy Officer Wood. Um, if the bill were enacted, how would Democracy NYC propose to work with the board of a, a BOE and BAAC and other agencies to conduct outreach and inform eligible municipal workers about non-citizen voting? What would that look like? Well, um, I, I would. I can't tell you how much we would welcome the board as a true partner in that effort. Um, historically, you know, they they administer elections. They don't historically do a lot of outreach to actually register New Yorkers, and we would absolutely love to have them as partners in that effort, regardless of whether Intro 1867 becomes law. Um, but what I will say is that I think we would continue doing what we've been doing these past several years in close partnership with um, our friends at the Campaign Finance Board, which of course is closely affiliated with, with the VAC, um, and, and try to go out into communities in New York where we think there would be eligible residents um, and, and try to talk to them about the importance of voting. And, and you know, we, we all have drunk the Kool-Aid. I think we all know that it's a great privilege. And, um, but, but until we have higher registration rates and, and higher participation rates, you know, our work is really never done. So it's a combination of outreach, uh, working with community-based organizations, um, conducting forums, working with local elected leaders, including, of course, members of the council um, to, you know, to really get the word out. And, and I'll just mention that next Tuesday is actually National Voter Registration Day. And that's exactly what our team will be doing um, on the ground as we try to get as many New Yorkers registered as we can this fall ahead of the general election. Um, this is a question that I asked the Board of Elections that maybe um, uh, you could answer as well. Um, no, I'm sorry, I asked this of, of, of advocates before. Um, do you have a sense of um, in jurisdictions that have implemented non-citizen voting, do, do non-citizens generally vote at similar rates to citizens? Um, my understanding is that there is not a, a clear comparison. I, I don't think we have clear statistics on that. Uh, I'm not sure if any of my colleagues from Moya have, have more to add on that. Um, but it's certainly an interesting question and one I would love to learn more about. Sorry, I'm, I'm not able to, to shine light on that right now. I mean, I have a a hypothesis, which is that they would probably vote in higher rates than citizen, citizens that, um, that are registered to vote. But um, I don't have that any empirical data to back that up. That's just a hypothesis. Does anyone have any, any, um, any data on that question from the administration? Hi, this is Raquel, Commissioner of Moya. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing good. Um, so on the question of data, we can absolutely um, help share more information on data from other localities. Uh, but from our understanding is that um, where there is non-citizen voting, it's for school, uh, school boards and school board elections um, with the exception of Tacoma Park. Um, and Tacoma Park has about 18,000 um, uh, non-citizens registered to vote. So it, it, would be, it wouldn't be anything in comparison to what would happen in New York City. There is really nothing to compare it to. Um, um, 
how would this bill affect the city's efforts, education efforts around ranked choice voting? Would it have any impact on that? Or how would you see those two, these two um, initiatives or efforts um, correlating? Thanks for unmuting. Uh, I think it would actually be very similar to what we did this past spring. Um, of course, we're not gonna have ranked choice voting in elections again for a couple of years. Um, but, but I think, you know, assuming that things are more or less the same, what we would want to do is ensure that we have educational materials, opportunities to learn more in multiple languages. Um, as I mentioned before, our advertising and education campaign last spring featured materials and ads in up to 25 languages. Potentially, we could even expand on that um, if, if resources permit. Um, and we also worked with a number of community-based organizations to help do education and outreach on the ground. I would like to see an even greater investment in that going forward. Um, we were so grateful that we were able to do it at all, um, but with more time and more, more, more runway, you could, you could really start hammering that information home much earlier. Um, and that is something that we worked very closely with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs on this past year. Um, just one, one piece of our work, which I'm especially proud of, was a, series, was a We Speak video, which is actually geared towards New Yorkers who are learning English. Um, and it was a, a video about ranked choice voting featuring an immigrant family and it's just beautiful. Um, I'd be happy to share it. So, so things like that, more, I think more of the same, more partnership with CBOs. Um, I mentioned our work with NYC Votes, the New, York, the New York City Campaign Finance Board. And with them, we have a coalition or a consortium of more than 50 organizations that is constantly growing. So we would continue our work with them to help get the word out to all New York voters. Um, so taking us kind of a step back for taking a kind of broader perspective here um, and following up on um, on your testimony and your response to Councilmember Rodriguez's question, you know, does, um, and, and kind of in light of Councilmember Rodriguez's point, which is that, you know, we are in the waning days of this uh, you know, of, of this administration in this council. So, you know, January 1st, everything resets, new administration, new council, bill has to get reintroduced with a new sponsor. Councilmember Rodriguez is gone. I'm gone. Councilmember Cabrera is gone. We're all out. Um, Councilmember Yeager will still be here, but uh, the rest of us are, are, are going to be uh, long gone. So um, the question is, does this administration, I mean, do, do you want to do this? Do you this is a uh, this is a big deal. This is a big bill that um, would would have you know if you just stop to think about it for a second. I mean, what would what this would mean for for immigrant New Yorkers? Um, you know, I'm possibly a million immigrant New Yorkers um, who are um, the lifeblood of this city. Um, uh, you know, in every borough, in every community, um, and um, is the future of this city. The future of this city is is our immigrant New York. Um, and you know, giving I mean, you know, people that have come here from uh, non democratic countries uh, that may not have uh, a real functional uh, uh, vote. Um, in their countries um, that they're from. And they came here. Maybe some of them had a great risk to themselves and their families um, or, you know, left behind um, everything they knew. Uh, we think about um, um, what um, some of the, um, some of the people that are uh, uh, escaping Afghanistan over the last couple of months and what they've had to give up um, everything in their lives, uh, careers, you know, people that were doctors and then are going to be coming here without any assurance of being able to continue their professional careers and their, um, uh, 
maybe coming here with nothing, nothing to pose on their back, you know, the money in their wallet. Um, uh, does this administration want to do this bill and work with the council to get this bill passed in the remaining three months that we have here? Because it's kind of now or never. I mean, at least for this, for us, maybe the next council and the next administration could do it, but, but uh, if we're going to do it, it's now or never. I, I do appreciate it's, it is September 20th. I am, I am well aware of that date. Um, and, you know, we've had a lot of challenges that we've faced in, in the past 18 months. Um, I, I, what I can say right now is that I, I completely hear you. Um, we are here today. We welcome the conversation. Um, there is still time left. It's, it's not, you know, it's not December 31st, it's September 20th. So that's good. And um, we think that this deserves more conversation. We, we, what I think we don't want is to set up a system that is designed to fail. Um, and we want to make sure that we're on solid ground, both from a policy perspective, but also from a legal one. Um, and so that's why I can't really say, say more today on, on that ultimate question. Okay, but that's, got, that's a question that's gotta be answered soon um you know i mean we're having the hearing today so it's a live bill it could get passed before the end of the year and the question is is i mean if we're gonna if we're going to um you know if we're gonna if we're gonna if we're gonna work on this bill between now and the end of the year if we're gonna work to pass it we gotta kind of um put our shoulders to the grindstone and and and, and do some real work on it so um that's 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 kind of the big question that I have coming out of it. Um, uh, I want to just actually just pass it over to, to, to Moya for a second um, and just talk about what um, what Moya sees in terms of kind of the the the, the risks that have been uh, talked about today um, to um, to immigrant New Yorkers, if they were, if, if we were to pass this legislation and this kind of idea that people could be at risk for mistakenly voting in a state or federal election, and you know, who knows, you know, maybe we have some very um, uh, um, uh, mean-spirited uh, federal or state administration that wants to go after people. Um, and charge them criminally like they did. I, I think of um, uh, of a, a a woman named um, Maria Ortega in um, uh, Fort Worth who um, was charged criminally for voting as a non-citizen, and by the Fort Worth District Attorney and the Attorney General of Texas. Um, I will look up their names so that I can call them out by name. Um, she served prison time and is now in the process of being deported an absolute travesty of justice. What would Moya be doing to um, make sure that we mitigate any of those risks in the, in the um, worst case scenario that something like that were to happen to New York? Sure, so thank you for that question. Um, I think that is of utmost concern uh, for us here at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Um, if this bill were to pass, uh, of course we would um, work on making sure that there is privacy when it comes to the issue of uh, one's status of whether they're a citizen or a legal permanent resident. Um, and we would take the utmost care uh, with that information. Um, but that is uh, something that um, is very much a concern for us, as you just mentioned, uh, the example of that case. Um, and we have seen, you know, in you know, in New York City, the case of people, whether they've claimed uh, and actually gotten citizenship, some people actually have gotten even into elected office and then uh, taken out because of issues like this. Um, and so we just want to make sure that there is that level of um, care when it comes to assuring that someone is not going to get in trouble because they're a registered voter and voted and may you know, vote in the wrong election. 
By the way, the the the, um, the woman in, in Fort Worth, Rosa Maria Ortega, the attorney general in Texas is Ken Paxton, who prosecuted her along with Sharon Wilson, who's the Tarrant County uh, uh, district attorney. Um, I remember tweeting at, uh, at the Tarrant County district attorney's office at the time and uh, them passing the buck over to uh, the attorney general in Texas. Um, uh, so they didn't even have the courage to stand up for their unscrupulous um, prosecution. Uh, it's, it's a travesty, um, but something that, that you know, we would want to be on guard against um, in, in the case that that, that happened. Um, are there, I mean, is, are there federal immigration risks that Moya would foresee in terms of people's immigration status? If they were to mistakenly vote in a federal election, I mean, is that is that the kind of thing that could potentially lead to a risk of deportation? I mean, that that could come up as as you may know when one applies for citizenship. Um, there is the question of if you've ever represented yourself as a U.S. citizen, and if you've ever voted in a federal election. Um, so that it could potentially become an issue for someone. Uh, once then, when they go and apply for citizenship affirmatively. Um, okay, I, I don't know if uh, any of my uh, colleagues have any further questions. If Councilmember Rodriguez has thought of any other questions he wants to ask before we let the administration go. Or Councilmember Yeager. Sure, it looks like Councilmember Rodriguez with his hand raised. Councilmember Rodriguez. Yes, uh, as everyone know, I have my personal interest because I'm one of those 100,000 New Yorkers who live in the shadow, who pay the taxes, who contribute to the city, who become teachers, lawyers, architects, elected official, and they, their right has been denied. So one thing that I gotta say is about Nothing prohibits anyone to try to register to vote without being citizen today. Because anyone can get a, a form at the board election, fill out a form, and mark that they're citizen every, 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 even though they're not, right? So that's a crime. So as we you know, and, and as we as a city have been educating all the voters so that they know who has the right to vote and people know that there is a form. People know that I could go out and say, I have my green card from, as I say, 83 to 2000. I, I, it is a crime to register to vote. I never thought about it. I did my contribution different way because New York City through the board election and the immigrant rights group been doing their job, letting people know who had the right to vote. So our people are not stupid. That if they are saying you have the right to vote in local election if you have green card. So we questioning the smart or people. Like this institution that you have seen in, in the screen right now, from the Immigration Coalition and more than 65, as the Commissioner for Immigration, she did it when she used to run the Northern Manhattan Immigration Coalition. Being a spending time, resources, human capital, educating our people. So let's not get into like, if this can be one or two cases or someone that doesn't have the right to vote in federal election and try to do so, when you do policy, you focus on the larger group. This is about a million New Yorkers that pay the taxes that the right has been denied. This is about restoring the right of people to vote in New York City. And they had a right before the 1900s when this city was mainly white. This is about addressing, giving a voice to underserved community that being infected and dealing with a, or a lot of pandemic beside COVID because they don't have a voice. Just look at Vermont. 
Look at it. I'm sure that you have. Vermont said the same thing. Before they made a decision recently to allow few, two cities to vote in the local election, their constitution say that those that had the right to vote were citizens. But they realized that I didn't talk about the non-citizen and they passed the law. We're gonna be behind Vermont. You want to bring question about challenges if someone tried to vote in different election? Go to Maryland. Since 1990, executing the same law that I know that we will pass in New York City. So I think that when it comes to the case, the case is very clear. And again, you know, hey, Laura, I know where your heart is. And I know that big responsibility that you have because your life has been dedicated to expand democracy in New York City. But this is a new, a new discussion. That's my only thing. This is not a new discussion. This is something that we've been discussing for years and years. And I leave my first four years serving at the council where we were not able to accomplish a lot of things. I even was only able to pass one resolution in my first four years. And in the second term, I passed 36 law, 36. And most of the law that I tried to pass, I was told that I couldn't do it. So come on, let's get it done. Few for weeks, few for months, those of you who have not been part of this discussion for a year, let's get the briefing. But this is the time for us to pass it through. Okay, Councilman Rodriguez, thank you uh, very much. Um, and uh, with that, I'm gonna give uh, going once, going twice, Council members to ask questions to the administration. Seeing none, I thank you very much uh, for your time. Um, uh, Ms. Wood, Ms. Batista, Mr. Ochoa. Um, uh, as I as I said before, um, you know, if we're going to do this, you know, time is of the essence, um, um, and um, we should. Just as a parting thought to you, you know, we, we should not think that we shouldn't take it for granted um, that a next administration or council um, will, will, you know, will do this if we don't. Um, uh, if we if we believe in the policy, if we believe in um, um, advancing this, if we believe in this legislation. Um, then we should then we should actually uh, put in the work to do it over the next three months. Um, and with that, I thank you. And we'll, we'll uh, I'm sure that you will be uh, speaking closely with uh, the real chair of this committee, um, uh, Fernando Cabrera and uh, Bill Sponsor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councilman Rodriguez, I'll we'll now move on to the next panel, which will consist of representatives from the New York City Campaign Finance Board. Our panelists will include Assistant Ex Executive Director for Public Affairs, Eric Friedman, and Deputy Director of Public Affairs, Amanda Melillo. Before we begin testimony, I will- Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Uh, Councilor Rodriguez, before we leave, let them go, I'm sorry. Councilor Rodriguez does have, I, I just got a text from him, has one more question. Councilor Rodriguez, do you have one more question? Before we let everyone go here. I, I do sharing you, you know, you yes. and I have been working as a partnership many of things. I just want yes, to sir. end reading, I want to end uh, reading this. New York City must allow permanent residents and those authorized to work here to vote in municipal elections. I was proud to be a part of the kickoff of our city, our vote campaign. And I continue to support the passage of intro 1867. And at the end, he said, democracy should always be striving to be more inclusive and more representative of their constituents. Expanding the right to vote to people who live here, work here, raising family here, and collectively pay billions of dollars in taxes here 
should not be controversial. It should be the easiest vote you take in your career on the city council. When we expand engagement in our democracy, our city is a stronger, safer, and more responsible, responsive to the need and dreams of its residents. I urge you to pass intro 1867 to give all New Yorkers a voice in the greatest city in the world. This is the statement of the Brooklyn Borough President and hopefully new mayor, Eric Adams. Thank you very much, Councilman Rodriguez. Um, okay, I'll turn it back over to Community Council. Thank you. We'll now move on to the panel um, with the New York City Campaign Finance Board. Uh, before we begin, I'll administer the oath. Assistant Executive Director Friedman, Deputy Director Malillo, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Assistant Executive Director Friedman? Yes, I do. Deputy Director Malillo? Yes, I do. Thank you. You may begin your testimony. Uh, thank you. I want to thank uh, the acting chair. Councilmember Levin and members of the New York City Council Committee on Government, Governmental Operations for the opportunity today to testify on intro 1867, which would allow certain city residents to vote in municipal elections and intro number 2316, which would require a representative of city agencies to be in attendance for the entirety of a hearing where they are required to testify. Uh, again, I'm Eric Friedman, Assistant Executive Director for Public Affairs at the New York City Campaign Finance Board. And with me today is Amanda Moillo, Deputy Director for Public Affairs. As you know, the Campaign Finance Board is mandated by the New York City Charter to encourage and facilitate voter registration and voting by all eligible residents of New York City, but particularly among underrepresented populations. The CFB is often called before the city council to testify on relevant campaign finance and voting legislation, and we're happy to offer input on both bills today. I wanna briefly address council member Salamanca's bill intro 2316. We are supportive of measures to increase transparency and hold government officials accountable to the public they serve. It is already our agency practice to stay for the entirety of the committee meeting in case council members who were not present in the reading of oral testimony have questions for a member of our staff. Uh, we believe it's incredibly important to speak to our work and provide information where it is needed so the council can, can conduct their oversight role effectively and efficiently. Further, it's important to hear from advocates and others who provide useful information to the council. We strongly encourage everyone who's part of the oversight process be present for an entire hearing. We're also supportive of the principles underlying Councilmember Rodriguez bill intro 1867, which would allow lawful permanent residents and those holding work authorizations to vote in municipal elections. New York City is and always will be a city of immigrants. Our door is always open. It is what makes our city great. Every New Yorker who lives and works in our city contributes to the vitality of our communities. Every New Yorker who lives and works here should have a say in who represents them in government and have a voice on the policy issues that impact their daily lives. Likewise, elected officials should be held accountable to represent all New Yorkers, regardless of their citizenship status. By our count, this bill would give a voice to more than 825,000 people who are already part of our city's civic life. We are prepared to do our part to enact this bill should it be passed. We do wanna highlight several serious issues concerning potential unintended consequences of this legislation that could prove harmful if they're not addressed. The bill should not move through the legislative process before these certain questions can be asked, or can be answered, excuse me, uh, about the bill's implementation. We have several questions related to immigration law that are outside our scope of expertise, but we believe should also be further researched by the council. Our first concern is the privacy and safety of individuals with non-citizen immigration statuses. In an era where immigration policy, as we've been discussing today, is front and center, we want to ensure this, legis this legislation does not make it easier for any administration at the local, 
state or federal level to endanger the rights of vulnerable New Yorkers. The voter file is public information. It contains a person's name and address, which could be used for individual or targeted harassment. We urge the council to consider this possible consequence and take steps to ensure that the voter file is not used with malicious intent. We're also concerned that a municipal voter could inadvertently commit a felony by, vote, by voting a ballot that lists state or federal races. A simple poll worker error, like giving a municipal voter the wrong ballot at a poll site, could potentially put that voter at risk. Language within the state's automatic voter registration law provides legal cover for persons who are inadvertently registered as voters. But we are not certain that the same degree of protection can be applied in a situation where a voter actively votes a ballot, even if it is an inadvertent error. There are other questions outside of our particular expertise about the bill's interaction with immigration laws, such as, could the bill impact a person's citizenship status or their ability to vote in their country of origin? To provide assurances to the intended beneficiaries of this legislation, we urge the council to consult experts in immigration law to ensure all possible scenarios are addressed. We also have questions related, related questions um, about how the bill would be implemented. How would the Board of Elections confirm a person's immigration status is valid or be notified if that status is revoked or expires? Would an entirely separate set of ballot styles be required for municipal voters? We heard from the Board of Elections earlier on a few of these questions. And, and just as a side note, very happy to see uh, Mike Ryan healthy and back with us. Um, we hope the board's input is taken into consideration since they're the body that administers elections and manages voter registration. We defer to the board to discuss any further specific concerns related to implementation and how this bill would interact with existing state and federal election laws. We raise these questions in large part because the details of implementation will drive how we conduct the voter education component that supports it. From a programmatic perspective, this legislation would have a significant impact on the Campaign Finance Board's charter mandate to engage and register underrepresented voters. The scope of our outreach will necessarily increase with, a, with the prospect of adding nearly 1 million newly eligible voters to the voter rolls through municipal elections. To successfully reach this new population and inform them of their rights, an extensive ground game involving collaboration with community-based groups would need to be paired with an investment in an advertising campaign that would amplify the reach of these education efforts. To achieve the anticipated scale, together we should look to the census effort as a model for engaging the non-citizen population. Different strategies are needed than those we've traditionally used to reach currently registered voters. A successful campaign would need to rely on qualitative research where we'd hear from non-citizens directly about potential barriers they face, concerns they have, and what would help them to overcome those concerns so they could register and vote. This research should drive an advertising campaign that encompasses traditional advertising through television, radio, newspapers, and digital channels, but with a greater investment in community and ethnic media to get the word out. This should complement efforts across the city to engage people in their community using tools such as presentations and direct person-to-person -person content. We would also need to consider how to design the voter experience to minimize confusion. This bill would create a new type of voter that would register with a different voter registration form. We would need to retool our online resources to create a way to ensure voters are served the right information without running the risk that a municipal only voter would use a state registration form meant for citizens or vice versa. In addition to helping voters locate the correct registration option, we would also need to deliver different types of information to each kind of voter. For example, we would need to serve customized information to a municipal only voter audience on our website and in the online voter guide and email or text message election alerts. We would also want to explore providing more in-depth translations of information that we put on our social media platforms. In addition to the voter guide information on our website, we mail a printed voter guide to every registered voter in advance of municipal elections. 
Our voter guide is printed in several editions targeted to each voter's specific district. It is our goal to give every voter the information they need to cast an informed ballot on election day. Mailing print voter guides to more voters comes with an additional printing and postage cost. That depends on how many new municipal voters register. To reduce confusion for municipal voters around which offices they're qualified to vote in, we anticipate the need to create voting instructions specific to municipal voters. We could provide a separate mailing for those voters or create an entirely new set of printed voter guides, voter guides that cater specifically to this population. We are also the agency mandated to provide education and outreach on ranked choice voting, which will be used in the rapidly approaching, yes, 2023 city council elections. In 2021, we accomplished our education mandate through coordination with citywide nonprofits, neighborhood and community groups, and other government agencies. We heard from these groups that our materials would be able to reach more New Yorkers if they were translated into more languages, which we did not have the capacity to accommodate. To meet the needs of more New Yorkers, we suggest that the legislation include additional language access requirements. The CFB currently translates our website and voting materials into the four federal Voting Rights Act languages, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, and Bengali. In our experience working with communities of naturalized citizens, Many voters prefer to receive election materials in the language they feel most comfortable speaking in, which may not be English. This means the diversity of languages spoken by New Yorkers should be represented in elections communications and should include written translations and in-person interpreters. By expanding language translations of our voting materials, we can also more effectively reach newly naturalized citizens who are also historically underrepresented groups. Translating the voter guide, website, and our social media accounts into additional languages will come at an additional cost, but it will be more than worthwhile to provide better service to voters. Lastly, uh, we'd also suggest that the council consider making the implementation date for the legislation effective January 1st, 2023. A policy measure with so much at stake requires adequate time to implement and ample time to educate newly registered voters. This date would also coincide with the 2023 city council redistricting elections. New York City would be the largest jurisdiction by far to expand the franchise for local elections to lawful permanent residents. Per our responsibilities to inform New Yorkers about their elections, we hope to remain engaged with the council as this bill goes through the legislative process. Specifically, as part of our charter mandated voter analysis report, we hope to include information in next year's report due in April, should intro 1867 be signed into law. Through our matching funds program and our NYC votes initiative, the campaign finance board is and continues to be dedicated to ensuring all New Yorkers have a say in our democracy. We thank the council for considering the issues we've raised here today and for the opportunity to testify and be part of this conversation. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much. Uh, do any of my colleagues have questions for the CFB? Um, okay, I just have a handful of questions here. Um, and if I, if it's, if this is redundant to aspects of your testimony, feel free to, to say that. Um, if this bill were enacted, would it, how would it affect uh, CFP's distribution of voter guides? Uh, would a separate guide for non-citizens be required, uh, non-citizen voters? Um, how would this affect the cost of producing and distributing um, the voter guide? And if possible, if you could give a breakdown of, of the cost impact um, uh, in terms of printing, mailing, translation, et cetera. I think here for the council, if we're gonna move forward and we need to produce a fiscal impact statement, we wanna take that information into account. 
Um, for certain. And so I, I think as, as contained in the testimony, you know, we certainly anticipate uh, additional costs and, and we're not here prepared with um, particular dollar amounts today, but happy to uh, consult further with the council as the bill moves through the legislative process. Um, you know, as, as, as I outlined, you know, it's certainly possible that um, we would consider you know, a, a separate edition of the voter guide for, for this new class of voters. Uh, where the bills go forward. Um, you know, I think those those decisions, uh, you know, I think require a little bit more uh, conversation on our side. Um, but I think, you know, what is clear to us um, from, from the legislation is that, and, and from you know, the nationwide discussion around immigration, like we need to work really hard to make sure that, that the folks who are uh, affected by this bill have the information they need to be able to vote safely. Um, and, and, and to exercise their rights fully um, and, and ensure that they aren't caught up in, in um, sort of inadvertently dangerous behavior. And, and so, again, if the bill goes forward, we are ready and committed to making sure that it, that, um, that information gets to voters. Do you have any suggestions for improving the confidentiality provisions in the bill? You know, that, that I mean, we're in an area that's a little bit beyond the scope of our expertise. Um, and, and we would, you know, for the Board of Elections, as, as they're the keepers of the voter rolls, um, you know, we would kind of defer to them on, uh, on kind of some of those operational considerations. I think, you know, there's, there's this tension here where, um, you know, not just not just the CFB and, and, and other groups, but you know, ca campaigns are dependent on having access to those voter rolls so that they can do voter outreach and ask ask voters for their votes. Um, and so, you know, whether whether you're talking about a list of municipal voters or a list of, of voters who are eligible to vote in state and federal elections, um, those lists are going to be public. Um, and so, I think again, a lot. Uh, I think. So there's some more discussion needed about how we can best protect um, uh, people who register as municipal voters. You know, we've, we've said and we've committed as a city, you know, we're, um, that our city is a sanctuary, right? We're, we're dedicated to uh, protecting people from all over the world who come to New York and, and, and want to be a part of, of city life. Um, you know, we're, we're supportive of what this bill is aiming to do and we want to make sure that that prom promise is, is carried out. Um, are there any other implementation challenges that you would like to bring to our attention as you see them? Um, you know, I think we've tried to include as much as we can um, uh, in our written testimony, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll kind of I'll look to Amanda also to see if there's anything else that she'd like to add to that question. I mean, yeah, I think we went over that in our written testimony, just in terms of how we would want to think about designing the voter experience to make sure that people are um, using the right registration forms, they're getting the right information. I think this would just require some, some research and some working with uh, design experts to think about how we can retool our existing uh, mm -hmm. materials in order to really help people you know, participate in the correct ways and minimize confusion, because I think there's high potential for confusion here. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we've been discussing a lot internally is about language access specifically. Um, and that's certainly something that we would want to think about in terms of expanding um, the languages that we translate into and also what materials we translate into. And that's something we would want to work with the council on. Okay, no, I greatly appreciate it. I, I will say just that, uh, you know, with 12 years of experience now working with the CFB, and I'm saying this as somebody who's not running for anything anymore. I don't have an open CFB account. I'm not trying to curry favor with the CFB, but I, I just want to uh, express my appreciation um, for CFB's commitment to expanding democracy in New York City. I think it's been an important um, uh, player in, in that. And um, in my book, you guys are all right. And uh, I just want to thank you for, um, for all that you continue to do. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. Thank you for, yeah. your, for your service on the council. And uh, sorry to see you go. Yeah.
riding off into the sunset. Um, okay. Uh, if my colleagues have any questions, Commissioner Rodriguez, Commissioner Yeager, questions for CFP. Okay. Councilmember Rodriguez has the same level, Chair. Okay. Councilmember Rodriguez. You get Adonis, you're up, or do you need to unmute yourself? Okay, now it's fine. Uh, thank you, Chair, and and thank you to both to Eric and Amanda for, you know, giving your testimony based on your own experience. It, it, and of course, like you know, we know that we have a a one of the best campaign finance board in the whole nation. And so then that make all of us that are run to office being accountable as it should be. And to protect also, you know, the taxpayer and to be sure that, you know, the, the investment is made to do the educational work. And can we agree that in New York City, we have a very low turnout when it comes to election? Yeah. And that, Jen. right? And that it doesn't hurt, right? To add a new group of voters that will expand the level of participation. Is that something that we can agree? Of course, I'm not asking you the legal part. You know, this is something that we have to figure out. But assuming that we pass it, that, you know, the, the, yeah, we heard from you guys, you know, you had the, you had the capacity, the men and women and the expertise to, you know, to, address with new challenges, to address with new investments, you know, any challenges that we can have. But isn't that, couldn't that be a good thing for democracy if we are able to add new voters to participate in the decision on how we elect elected officials? Um, certainly, you know, uh, look, again, I'll kind of call back to what we said in the testimony, you know, our our specific mandate is to ensure that New Yorkers who are underrepresented, um, you know, play a, an increased role in, in our democracy in New York City. So we're, we're, we are required to um, find ways to help underrepresented populars um, be better represented among those who are registered to vote and those who vote. So yes, um, you know, expanding opportunity to join the electorate um, making sure that we're communicating with people to, to play an active role in the electorate. Um, all these are good things. You know, I think we have, again, we have questions about kind of just making sure that we're doing it uh, in a way that honors their participation and, and, and uh, doesn't put people at risk. But, um, you know, we are all served better when, when government is, is most representative, most representative uh, of the people who live here. And so that's... Um, that's, those are values that we, that would govern our work um, through and through. So agreed. I, Amanda, I, I ask you anything to add. I would love to add to that because I think one thing for the council to consider is, you know, we're talking about large numbers, you know, 825 people, 825,000 people who could potentially be impacted by this bill and suddenly be able to register to vote. Um, I you know, one of the things we've been discussing internally is that this would really need to be paired with an investment in making sure that they know uh, that they can get registered, that they can participate. Um, you know, this came up earlier in the hearing when people were asking about usage rates in other cities that allow non-citizens to vote. So Tacoma Park, Maryland is one of, I believe, 12 jurisdictions uh, around the country that allow non-citizens to vote. Um, in, in all municipal elections, not just school board elections. Um, we did get in touch, not with Tacoma Park, but with Hyattsville, Maryland, which is about a similarly sized city. They have about 12,000 registered voters um, and they only have 250 voters who are non-citizens, but legal permanent residents. So that really speaks to the scale of even if you make this available to people, that doesn't mean that they know about it without that sort of investment by the city and making sure that they do. You know, San Francisco, which is a city we often look to as another example, um, they have 500,000 registered voters in San Francisco. They allow non-citizens to participate in school board elections. 
um, they only have 36 non-citizen residents signed up to participate in school board elections. So when, when we're talking about opening the doors and allowing all these people to vote, I think it is going to take a real effort to make sure that there's significant public education around it. And, 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 and of course, like when I used to be a college student, I thought that I would be able to make the revolution of changing the society and be able to bring all the changes that I that I believe on when it comes to social justice. But now we migrate here at the age of 56. Now I see that pilot project has its merits. So I think that even though we look at those two, uh, Maryland and Vermont, we, can, we have to be looking about that could be pilot projects. Because the question is, you know, how can we restore the rights? And that's my thing that I even try to make my case to my colleague, who we can be in the different side at this moment. This is a bipartisan. It's not about Democrats. It's not about the progressives. It's not about the socialists. It's about giving the voice for people that came from the former, for the from the from the former Soviet Union. I have many of them who live in Bennett Avenue. So this is about. You know, when I used to be teaching at Luperon High School, the school that I was a co-founder, there was a teacher, Ms. Batino. I never saw Ms. Batino as an immigrant because when we look about this particular crew that will benefit, we think about Latinos, Asian, and Black. And Black, we're thinking about the recent group, the recent African that come from Mali or that come from Ghana or that come from Nigeria. But this is about people that are Italian, that are Irish, that are Poland, they you know that are from other places, but that they are here in the city of New York, that they work in the media, that, that they, they have a work permit to do the job, that they pay the taxes. We will be giving the, those individuals a voice. And I think is that, you know, when we already have the federal law already has established, the state in the city has the right to decide who vote in the local election. New York City didn't require for people to be citizens in the early voting process that we have. Here we have this opportunity. Here we have voting power with 34 council members. Here we have four board presidents, except the one from the Staten Island. Here we have the public advocate. Here we have the controller. Here we have what we hope is gonna be the new controller and the new mayor. So I hope again that working among all of us, we can be able to figure out any piece that is related to how we still can make it better. And I think that Adding nearly 1 million voters doesn't necessarily mean all we come out to vote. That falls on us to educate and get people out to vote. But I want to emphasize that adding voters is never a negative for our democracy. And I don't know, how do you see uh, from the campaign finance board role, if, that, if we are able to pass this bill, that I hope that we will, how do we see as an opportunity as we should be adding more resources for you guys to work with all institutions that are here and all the who are not, that have been the voice of immigrants to educate them. Because I want to bring back, and I said before, I hope that no one bring the question about, but what will happen if someone registered in, if, to vote in a federal election? Like campaign finance board right now, you know, if anyone decides to run, to run say, who can contribute to a candidate? The only thing that the person has to do is to sign in. They don't have to submit any proof. The campaign finance board run the audit and they find out if there's any question or anything, then they call candidates, whatever. When anyone register today to vote, no anyone can go out and try to register even though they are green card holder, but people are educated. New York City is doing a great job to be sure that New Yorkers know that in order to be registered today, they have to be citizens because the constitution of the United States or the or New York State say that you have to be citizen to vote. And I said again, what the constitution provides the opportunity for is that it doesn't say if non-citizen, what can be registered to vote beside the citizens. And again, this is like a legal part that we hope that we will you know, deal with, but I want to bring to the attention of everyone that I know that if we move this bill, you guys from the campaign finance board, we have a major role to play when it comes to work with the rest of New Yorkers to educate the voters.
I, I, I'm not sure if there was a question in there, but I, I, I'll agree that, you know, I think as we've said, and, and, and um, I think we do have a lot of work ahead of us um, if and once this bill passes um, to prepare um, this new community to, to, you know, to fully take advantage of the rights uh, that we'd be offering them for sure. And, and we, we absolutely stand ready to participate. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, seeing no other questions for CSB, uh, we'll let you guys go. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. We'll now turn to public testimony. Please be advised that for this portion of the hearing, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once her name is called, uh, the sergeant will unmute you and start the timer. Please wait for the sergeant to start the timer before you begin. Uh, I'd now like to welcome Felicia Singh to testify, followed by Molly Selner, and then Rodrigo Camarena. Felicia Singh, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. I am Felicia Singh, Democratic nominee for the 32nd City Council District. It's an honor to testify on behalf of Intro 1867 to expand voting rights in New York City elections to nearly 1 million non-citizen New Yorkers. Voting rights are very much tied to the wellness and healing of our communities. The intersectionality between who can and cannot vote is directly correlated to who progresses and who is left behind in our communities. We are the greatest city in the world, a sanctuary city, a city of dreams, and also a place where we leave behind nearly 1 million people. It's time we close the gap of exclusivity. I was raised in South Queens, home of Little Guyana, Punjab Avenue, and my own neighborhood of Ozone Park, where residents immigrate from places like Select, Bangladesh, with hopes of a better life. Indo-Caribbeans, Punjabis, and Bangladeshis have contributed to our city for decades and still struggle to have equal opportunities for representation. Over the years, I've done voter registration, led a civic association, and helped folks apply for their citizenship. I cannot forget the disappointment on our neighbors' faces when they talk about how it feels to be unable to participate in democracy. Non-citizen New Yorkers count for the census every 10 years, and then they are cut into or out of gerrymandered districts. The hardship of being an immigrant is felt devalued by the inability to vote for who makes decisions about their livelihoods and their lives. There's no such thing as immigration reform without the ability to vote. Non-citizens clean our streets, they drive us around, they mow our lawn, serve us our breakfast, wash our clothes, own 52% of our local businesses and pay taxes. The pandemic has shown us that our immigrant community members are the backbone of this city and essential. Expanding voting rights is crucial in moving towards a post-pandemic New York City. While voting rights are being threatened by racism and big bigotry across this country, it's time for New York to set an example, take a stand to finally give the power of the vote to all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Singh. And now I'd like to welcome Molly Selner Harris to testify. After that, I'll be calling on Rodrigo Camarena and then Olivia Adichie. Molly Selmer Harris, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Thank you. We are submitting this testimony on behalf of the New York chapter of the American Immigration Law Association, AILA, the national, nation's largest professional organization of immigration attorneys. My name is Molly Selner Harris, and I am the co chair of the committee's uh, uh, media and advocacy committee for the New York chapter of AILA. And I thank you for the opportunity to address the Committee on Governmental Operations regarding the proposed legislation intro 1867, uh, a bill allowing for lawful permanent residents in New York City to vote in municipal elections. 
ALA has over 17,000 members nationwide with more than 1,700 members in New York whose practice span the entire scope of immigration law. I'm reducing my um, oral, oral testimony and I have written this a little bit longer. Because of our knowledge, experience and ex expertise in immigration law, including detailed detail dealing with adjudications of naturalization applications by the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, CIS, we wanna share our thoughts on this proposed legislation. Um, I know people mentioned the 12 other municipalities in New York that in the United States that allow non-citizens to vote. But as far as I understand, San Francisco being the much lar the largest of them all have, they are not allowing school board elections and they have not implemented them until November, 2022, which will be the first time. That is my understanding. Um, Council member Yadonis Rodriguez, when she, when he, excuse me, introduced the bill back in January, 2020, spoke passionately about his own journey as a longtime lawful permanent resident, paying her, his taxes and helping out on many lo local political campaigns. That same day, council member Carlos Menchaca also spoke in support of the bill stating, this is gonna be a complicated conversation to restore those rights and to allow for our city to embed their voice in our municipal elections. Yes, it's a complicated conversation. We wholeheartedly agree that the enfranchisement of, lo of legal immigrants on local matters gives them an exclusive, inclusive voice in their communities on issues that most affect their day-to-day -day lives. It provides more, a more equitable representation of those who live in New York City. But at the same time, we have serious concerns about the actual practice of non-citizen voting locally can lead to the deniability of the ability to natural, their denial of their ability to naturalize and potentially make them vulnerable to removal from the United States. And as we, it's been addressed before, the, the question on the naturalization application, have you ever claimed to be a United States citizen? Have you ever registered to vote in a federal state or local election in the United States? Have you ever voted in a federal state or local election? Also, I want to address that Section 237A6A of the Immigration and Nationality Act, um, 8 U.S.C. 1227 states, any alien who votes in a violation of a federal, state, or local constitutional provision, statute, ordinance, or regulation is deportable. Time expired. Yeah, I'll be quick, and I'll just say the challenge before this council and subsequently for the New York City Board of Elections is twofold. First of all, you have to provide enough um, budgetary um, budget to train and educate everyone. Let me just say one more thing that's really, really important that has not been addressed and that there must be uh, addressing uh, CIS staff and training at the for the adjudicators who will get these questions and they'll be the ones deciding and where they'll be providing, I'm just throwing off the, they'll be, be sending these um, denials to the legal department at uh, the ICE, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and putting them in for, into proceedings for deportation. And there needs to be some addressing of that, because um, I do think it's uh, not going to just be a few. I think it's going to be a, a large number of immigrants who could be subject to um, criminal immigration consequences. Thank you. Um. Councilor Rodriguez, do you want to say something? Yes, I do. Okay. Yes. Uh, first of all, no one is an alien. And we have people that are citizens. We have other people that have green card holders, and we have other people that are undocumented. And the second thing is, as someone that has a green card, I'm not smart enough, as my brothers and sisters are, to know where they can be registered to vote. So as I had green card from 83 to 2000, when I became a citizen in 2000, I also knew that I couldn't raise it to vote, to vote in any uh, federal election or in any election because I was not allowed to do it. So our people are smart. Our group that does a, a voting right and immigrant right, they will do the job. And, and that's all I want to add. Okay. Um, I have a few questions, uh, if I may, for, um, for Ms. Harris. Um, first one, uh, to what extent do current visa backlogs delay U.S. citizenship for those who wish to naturalize? Can maybe... You can hear me? I don't know when yes. I get uh, Really good question. Um, it's serious right now because of the pandemic has really set everything back. I can't tell you, you can go online. I think it's um, 
to apply for citizenship right now is probably um, over a year, if not up to two years, just to get your interview and to get sworn in. So it's, it's pretty significant. Uh, I would say um, you probably won't, if you apply now, you probably won't, you may not be able to vote in the next federal election. Well, definitely not in 2022, but who knows for next presidential. Now, are there any groups of non-citizen individuals who you think should have the right to vote in local uh, elections who do not qualify under this bill as municipal voters or conversely, are there any groups who do qualify as municipal voters under this bill that, who, in your opinion, should not be voting in a local election? You know, it's funny. I wasn't able to really give my full testimony, and I hope you all get a chance to read it. I, I really, uh, and I, in my other life, <laughs> I am a very much a, a member of a giving circle who does a lot of like voter protection. Uh, voter protection. I was actually in, De in De Dearborn, Michigan, in 2020. Um, um, being a voter, you're making sure people can vote. So I'm extremely supportive of that. And I also didn't mention that, um, you know, I want to make it clear that my effort to is even, we want to state our testimony is not an effort to marginalize the voices of non-citizens, but a request to protect the ability of them to become U US citizens in the future. I, I, I don't want to speak to whether or not undocumented versus documented. I, I think, you know, obviously in municipal elections, having their voice heard, having you to know, pay taxes, everything, I super support it. I just think the rollout will cause so many more immigrants to actually lose their voice. They'll lose their voice by not being able to become citizens and they'll be deported. And it won't be just one or two. So, um, I mean, so I understand kind of your perspective. Um, is there, what's the solution then as you see it? I mean, like what, if, if you, if you and the uh, AILA ha had, um, could, could, um, could snap your fingers and address <laughs> the issue of non-citizens being able to vote in municipal elections, um, how would you do it? Well, I mean, there, there's gotta what be- What would you do? Okay, I would, like the, um, like, um, the CFD, CFB said, we have to be, a, and other organizations think the mayor's office also addressed it. There has to be a, a, a continuous funding stream that allows for training, not just of the general public, but election workers. There has to be a full level comprehensive regulatory oversight that has to be pretty regular, you know, has to be really on top of um, the implementation uh, and effective monitoring of polling locations. Um, just as a matter of anecdotal, anecdotal story, when I was in Dearborn, Michigan, we were at two, it was one polling location, two election districts. So we had about, it was six total poll workers there. And as we know, there was a huge need for new poll workers under the 2020 election because of the pandemic. Two of the six were over the age of 20. So we had four election workers were 16, 17, 18 years old. And yes, they were trained and yes, they're educated. Yes, I just, just watching what was happening and it ended up being a non-citizen voted in the federal in 2020. Someone told me as I was, I, I was there that a, a young woman had come in and voted in that election and was not a citizen. So, you know, it, it, it happened in my one brief moment. So, mm -hmm. and no one knew. I'm concerned that it kind of gives like, like a, a lifeline to like this, like, or, or that, or that the, the potential of having a non-citizen voting in an election where they are not authorized to vote in a federal election, like that that is a, um, that that's like, you know, a gift to the um, uh, 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 wing nut uh, 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 ecosystem that uh, is obsessed with, uh, you know, the, the Trumpian big lie of voter, you know, rampant voter fraud. I mean, are you, are you worried? I mean, is one of your concerns that like this is, would play into that wacko ecosystem that uh, our former president um, uh, pours former gasoline guy. all over, all, all over the time, all the time? The former guy, I mean, obviously that's part of the, um, you know, the, all the misinformation that's going out there. And obviously that could be definitely great for uh, Tucker and Ann Coulter and all them. Uh, I'm sorry, Lauren Ingram, mm -hmm. I get them too confused. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's more of a, you know, a, a, a practical matter. Uh, how, 
It's not a matter of a choice by a prosecutor. I know Ken Paxton aside, and let's not get into that. You're mm-hmm. going to have it at any level and um, you know, any place could could prosecute um, for sure. But I mean, you know, that's a that's a different issue. It's more like ICE will deep will, will will put proceedings against person. But even in the least, you're gonna be denied citizenship, and that's not discretionary. This is not a discretionary matter. You know, we talk about discretion. There's no discretion. An adjudicator at this, at the, um, you know, custom, I mean, citizenship and immigrants and services will deny that person citizenship. That's it, done, never getting it again. There's no discretion. And it doesn't mean I did it by mistake. The, the, there's case law, and I didn't really address it because again, didn't have time. Board of Immigration Affairs 2015 decision, matter of Fitzger- Fitzpatrick, found that um, an, of- an offense is a general, not a specific intent, which means that even if a non citizen voted by mistake without intent, they are still removable. So, like, it's, it's, it's across the board. And that's, and, that's like, and that's like an administrative right. thing that is not a judicial. It's categor- It's a categorical conversation. It's not, you can't, a lot of immigration law, and I, let me try to put a perspective, a lot of immigration law when it comes to um, adjudication and it comes to, it's not about your specific story, whether you have um, a really um, sympathetic case, you have, you know, U.S. citizen children, you've never been back at your home country, you know, all these story, all these situations doesn't even come into play. The judges don't have any jurisdiction to consider your specific story. They are going to have the law that has to be implemented because there is no discretion. They have to, because it's at the first level of, of, the, of the analysis of it. Um, and so at the first level of analysis, they say, did you do this? Yes. Well, and this- what is specifically the question that's asked? The question would be, would you, uh, did you ever vote in a federal, state or local election? First, did you ever register? Obviously, if they voted only in the local election, then the CIS hopefully understands the difference between voting in a local election. They have to say yes to that answer. And so the yes is a red flag. And during that adjudication of their citizenship application, you hope, you hope that the CIS officer and their supervisors understand yes is OK. Right. In the same way for that the for local in-, in this case, like like in Tacoma Park. Right. Let me give you an example as a way of analogy. There is a question on the citizenship application asks if you ever had military training. OK, which causes people to think, well, you, you know, there's a whole lot of questions about paramilitary, military, terrorist organizations, all this stuff. But mm-hmm. if you're an Israeli citizen, it is likely you've had military training, also Korean citizen. So CIS is knowledgeable. I've never had a problem mm-hmm. with my Israeli or my Korean clients apply for citizenship, they have to say yes to that. And I'm sure there are others, I don't know, but that's where my experience is, but you can imagine. And they say, okay, great, no problem. They obviously get, you know, mandatory um, conscription, right? They're educated in that way. It's in the, probably in the adjudicator's adjudicator's manual, field manual. Mm -hmm. But in this area, it is completely new. And, um, you know, you're looking at, CIS officers who are overworked, they're trying to adjudicate loads of cases. um, And they're, you know, it's, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've had to educate them on the law all the time. I mean, presumably, right. Like if they're, if they're, if they're an adjudicate or if they're a case field, field officer in, in, in the city of New York, you know, then they will know the, the local laws of the city of New York. I mean, there's, there's, in other words, if they're, 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 they're not, they're not uh, location specific. They're getting cases from all over the United States, or you know, if, or if you're a field officer, you're like working in the city. You're you're just going to be working in the city. Well, they get moved around. There's the, the retention rate isn't great. You know, there's a lot of lot of new train new new adjudicators coming in. So I don't know if yeah, there's seasoned ones. will know they live in New York City. They may know the law. And let me just you know, address uh, Council Member uh, Rodriguez's uh, claim. I am not here to say that, um, you know, immer- uh, non-citizen immigrants aren't intelligent enough to understand the laws. I was, <laughs> I was very involved in politics from a young age and I understand it, but I can't tell you how many 
very educated immigrants that come into my office on issues and I have to explain things, but they heard this and they heard that. And we all do this. It's not about immigrants, it's about America. This is about human nature. We hear all sorts of things. Look at look at the vaccine information. Let's just go there. A lot of intelligent people making not such informed decisions, right? On whether to get the vaccine. So this is not, you know, it's about, you know, anyway, I'm just I just want to address that that's and and let me also say. The fact that they're coming to me means they have the financial ability to retain me. And even if um, you have lots of nonprofit organizations, you've got this CUNY Citizenship Now, which is an amazing citywide mm-hmm. effort that By helps means, people. Yeah. And I'm always sending my clients who, who really have, are struggling to even pay me in the previous. I, I, don't, I am a low bono. I don't even charge that much. But like, mm-hmm. you, you don't have so many who can, re, who can really afford it. We give a shout out to Central American Legal Assistance, which is in my district. There's many others. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. I used to work um, in the okay. power world, <laughs> so I know. Just Cala is one of my most wonderful organizations in the city. So. Yes, I used to work um, in Niana too. So, and City Bar, you know. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, any of my colleagues have any further questions? Vidanis, Kalman. Yeah, I, I, I promised myself to only hear the testimony because I think that, you know, the, the great public or the, uh, uh, the great members of the public that will be testifying are a group of people that we've been working for so many years. But I just want to call Molly or Harris and anybody else, please don't call undocumented people alien. That's a trend already we have eradicated from the city and for the whole nation. And the so second thing is about a uh, immigration coalition, uh, the Cuban immigrations, and many other not in Manhattan, the Asian community. Everyone been doing a job, and I can tell you that. Again, I want to focus ourselves about. Please don't bring the piece related about uh, what happened if someone tried to register for a federal election because people are not doing that. This is New York City. How many cases are Cuban immigration? A, 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 a program doing, working on it. Those of you that are doing a, a, a free services to, to, to immigrants, how many cases do you have or someone be subject to be deported because he or she tried to register in election? Bring the case down and then we talk. That could be happening in all these places, but that doesn't happen in New York City. So let's focus about the merit. We, our people are not dumb. Our people are smart. They will make the right decision and then we have the best group that care for our brothers and sisters in a bipartisan effort to be sure that only those who have green card, that have working paper, will be only registered in local elections. Thank you. Can I, I just, do, do I, have, can, I don't know if you can hear me. I just wanna clarify, I didn't use the word alien only when I was, referring to the statute. Unfortunately, the Immigration and Nationality Act still uses that term. I agree. I don't think we should use the term. There's a lot of bad language in our statutes, but that's the only time I think I used it, which was when I was referring to the statute. I was quoting the statute. Thank you, unless Council Member Rodriguez or the Chair have any further questions, we'll move on. Okay, great. Uh, next, we'll hear from Rodrigo Camarena, followed by Olivia Adichi and then Monica Bartley. Rodrigo Camarena, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Good day, members of the committee. My name is Rodrigo Camarena. I am the director of the Immigration Advocates Network, or IAN. We are the largest national network of nonprofit legal advocates dedicated to protecting immigrants. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the introduction of Intro 1867. As you all know, New York City is home to 3.1 million immigrants. Immigrants represent over a third of our city's population and nearly half of its workers and small business owners. The city is powered by immigrants, and yet over a million immigrant New Yorkers don't have a voice in choosing their local representatives. These New Yorkers have been contributing to our city, they've been paying taxes, and and have started almost half of all the small businesses in our city. 
Many are active in, our commun in their communities. And yet back in June, over a million of them weren't able to vote for their elected officials. That's not right. As we work to undo the damage caused by the Trump administration and ensure that the uh, President Biden upholds his commitments to immigrant justice, New York City needs to account for its own role in criminalizing and disempowering immigrants. From housing to policing, access to healthcare and the treatment of street vendors, our city has chronically harmed the very same people that the Trump administration so violently targeted. It is our duty as a city to chart a fair future along the very groups that we've historically marginalized and barred from spaces of decision-making. Empowering our immigrant and non-citizen neighbors with the right to vote in municipal elections is core to doing just that. The COVID-19 crisis hit hardest in low-income communities of color and neighborhoods home to some of New York's largest immigrant di diasporas. Decades of disinvestment in healthcare, affordable housing, protections for workers contributed to the high infection rates and disproportionate loss of life that we saw in outer borough and immigrant communities. Knowing this, we must ask ourselves whether the outcomes would have been different if elected officials were forced to be more responsive to the needs of immigrant voters. As a naturalized US citizen and resident of Sunset Park, Brooklyn, an immigrant rich community, this issue is personal to me. We have a generation of damage to undo and an, oblig an obligation to act boldly to pursue justice where it's been delayed or denied. We shouldn't be afraid of letting more New Yorkers participate in our democracy. We should be leading the fight to expand voting rights and be a model for the rest of the country. I urge the New York City Council to do the right thing and pass this legislation immediately. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Olivia Adichie to testify, followed by Monica Bartley and then Shruti Banerjee. Olivia Adichie, you may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you, Council. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Olivia Adechi, and I'm one of New York City's over 3 million immigrants. Um, I'm also a paralegal case handler with the Immigration Law Unit at the Legal Aid Society. And the Immigration Law Unit assists low-income New Yorkers fighting unlawful deportations and those seeking or trying to maintain lawful status. Over the most recent year, the unit assisted around 4,500 individuals with immigration matters. The Legal Aid Society supports non-U.S. citizen suffrage in New York City because if our city is to call itself a democracy, it cannot do so without enfranchising all adults who call it home, regardless of their immigration status. We believe that intro 1867 is an important step towards that. Immigrant New Yorkers are integral to the fabric, functioning, and tax base of this city, and always have been. Yet they do not have a meaningful way to participate in local electoral politics and that have huge impacts on their lives. Their lack of access to voting is particularly problematic now because during the pandemic, immigrants represented over half of the 1 million essential workers that kept the city going as the rest of us worked safely from our homes. In fact, according to the mayor's office, foreign-born workers represent approximately 56% of the workforce in essential industries and 58% of the workforce in essential occupations. It's also important to note, as others have said, that during the pandemic, the zip codes with high immigrant populations had the highest mortality rates and loss of income. Federal law does not preclude non-citizen voting in state or municipal elections as long as it is lawful for them to do so under state or municipal law. Of greater concern, however, is that is one claiming falsely claiming U.S. citizenship, which is a federal crime and a ground of deportability. For this reason, the Legal Aid Society recommends the council write municipal laws that enfranchise non-citizen voters, but also do all that is possible to protect them. For example, voter registration error is inevitable. Many people have mentioned it already today. We recommend the use of a voter registration form that does not give voters the option of choosing their citizenship, but instead solely relies on the affidavit affirming that the applicant is either a lawful permanent resident or is authorized to work in the United States. We recommend that for individuals who have registered on the basis of employment eligibility, the city verify their employment eligibility during the voting period and automatically suspend their ability to vote if that person becomes ineligible during the voting period. The strong, we also recommend and encourage the strongest possible confidentiality laws that would prohibit the city from sharing non-citizen voter registration forms with the federal government. Growing up, I always had some sort of legal immigrant status. I had the best case scenario for someone who moved here at a young age because I had a pathway to citizenship. Still, it took 14 long years and thousands of dollars for me to get citizenship and for now, for me to now be able to vote in the city I've called home my whole life. 
the Legal Aid Society urges the city to recognize the importance and equality of immigrants and the importance of enfranchising them. Um, I'll just finish this point. But we also stress the importance of carefully crafting the process to prevent the kind of human error that could hurt them. I want to emphasize that because something may be complicated, it does not mean it is not democratic, necessary, or morally right. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Monica Bartley to testify, followed by Shruti Banerjee, and then Maria Lozardo. Monica Bartley, you may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Levin, Acting Chair Levin, and committee members for affording me the opportunity to testify. My name is Monica Bartley, and I'm a community organizer at the Center for Independence of the Disabled New York. The Center for Independence of the Disabled, or Sydney, is a leading advocate for all New Yorkers of all ages and with all types of disabilities. We serve all New Yorkers regardless of their immigration status. Part of Sydney's mission is to ensure the full participation of individuals with disabilities in the electoral process and to encourage those who are eligible to do so. New York City has always been a city of immigrants who come here seeking a better life. They pay taxes, they put their lives on the line as seen during this pandemic. Immigrants have the right to contribute to bettering our city through participation in voting and elections. People with disabilities must be included in this process so that they can help to determine the necessary accommodations required for involvement at all levels of city life. Our city will be improved when all New York City residents that have committed to living here can participate in shaping it by helping to choose its elected leaders. The passing of Intro 1867 will allow all permanent residents with disabilities to contribute to the civic affairs of New York City so that they can represent themselves on issues that affect them. Sydney seeks that the New York City Council sign this bill into law. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Shruti Banerjee to testify, followed by Maria Lazardo and then Judy Lee. Shruti Banerjee, you may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you. I'm grateful for the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Shruti Banerjee and I'm a senior policy analyst at Demos. We are an action-oriented think tank that addresses the most pressing issues related to our democracy and economy through litigation and policy analysis. I previously served as a policy analyst in the New York City um, Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, so it's great to see a lot of familiar faces here. And on a personal note, I am the daughter of immigrants who have taught me the importance of getting involved in local politics to ensure that my community has equal access to public services. For our democracy to be truly inclusive and equitable, everyone's voice must be heard. Unfortunately, our current democratic system denies nearly a million of our fellow New Yorkers the right to participate in local elections. This includes over 480,000 essential workers in New York who have risked their lives to serve as our healthcare specialists, as well as keeping our grocery stores and our pharmacies open during this ongoing pandemic. This has prevented these non-citizen New Yorkers from having any power to determine the policies that will benefit their communities. This includes everything from access to public education, transportation, food security programs, community safety, and healthcare. Passing this bill and restoring voting rights to non-citizens in New York for local elections would be a vital step towards building a more representative and inclusive democracy. And I want to note that our written testimony includes a lot of data and historic analysis that reinforce many of the incredible points made here today by our council members and previous panelists about the importance of passing this bill and restoring voting rights to non-citizens. This includes analysis of other jurisdictions that have restored voting rights to non-citizens, as well as the incredible contributions that non-citizen New Yorkers have made to our communities. But in the interest of time, I want to focus on the importance of why we must pass this bill now. During this hearing, there has been discussion about the urgency of passing this bill. And one of the main reasons that it's important is the complex naturalization process and the backlog, the growing backlog that has hit record highs that is preventing millions of people across the country from participating in elections. 
Now, we've heard opponents of this bill argue that non-citizens in New York should just naturalize if they want to vote. But the naturalization process is incredibly expensive and lengthy. The application fee alone is $725. This includes just a filing fee and processing fee of $640 plus a mandatory $85 biometric fee. And this is just to submit the naturalization application. As we've heard from panelists before, if when it, the costs of legal fees come into it, this costs upwards of thousands of dollars for a to, for an immigrant to naturalize who's been here for decades. The application fee alone can make this process unaffordable and it serves as a barrier to the ballot box for many immigrants. And the argument that a non-citizen New Yorker should naturalize before they can vote is essentially the same thing as supporting a $725 poll tax for immigrants. The application fee, additionally, sorry, Naturalizing can take up to six to eight years, but the backlog of applications and delays due to the pandemic have further exacerbated the long application processing times. And as we've heard- people, was hard. Sorry, I just would like to add that the backlog has been well over a million according to USCIS data, and that's over 30,000 in the New York City Regional Office alone. These are 30,000 New Yorkers who are unable to participate in our elections due to a backlog. They've done everything right in the system together. I apologize, as you can hear, I live on a busy New York City block, and there's a lot of noise around. Um, but <laughs> I just want to say this bill is vital to ensure that 30,000 New Yorkers, upwards of 30,000 New Yorkers, have the ability to, who are waiting in the naturalization process, to vote immediately and, and have a say in the policies that govern their daily lives. Thank you, and I apologize again for all that background New York City noise. I felt like we needed that to make it more authentic. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Maria Lizardo to testify, followed by Judy Lay and then Caroline Scown. Maria Lizardo, you may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. Time starts now. Yes, good afternoon. I am Maria Lizardo, the executive director of a settlement house called NIMIC, Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation, and we serve community members in Upper Manhattan and the Bronx. Thank you for allowing me to testify today and Councilmember Rodriguez for your staunch support of the uh, bill of 1867. There are many false narratives when it comes to immigrant communities. We don't contribute to the economy, false. We don't pay taxes, false. We don't get involved in our local communities because we're so worried about our home countries, false. We are very active and very engaged when it comes to our local communities. We pay taxes, and during the pandemic, we saw who was on the forefront providing essential services to New York City. Half of all frontline essential workers are immigrants, and one in five are non-citizens. As involved as our immigrant communities are in local and civic engaged activities, we have every right to vote and to elect folks who represent our interests and who will be our voices when it comes to government, making sure that budgets invest in communities and making sure that the policies that are passed in our great city support our immigrant New Yorkers. I am the daughter of undocumented immigrants who came to this country in 1965 from the Dominican Republic. My mom was in involved in everything when it came to the local community. But one thing she couldn't do when she was a documented immigrant was vote. It is the one thing that she wanted to make sure that she got involved with, and she had to wait until she became a citizen in order to be able to do that. We need to stop that now, and we need to restore 1867. We need to restore the ability for our community members to vote. Please, I encourage you to do that today. Let the Board of Elections figure out how it will be done. Let the nonprofits on the ground do the work and the legwork and to educate folks on how to get this done. But please, let's make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Judy Lay to testify, followed by Caroline Scown, and then Wynne C. Tao. Judy Lay, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. Before I begin my testimony, I just want to commend Council Member Rodriguez for your passion and for fighting so hard and for so long. And also special shout out to Councilman Yeager. You are my councilman, and I'm thankful that you are here today, and I really appreciate your openness. 
Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Judy Lay and I'm the voting rights organizer at the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund's Democracy Team. ALDEF is a 47 year old New York based national civil rights organization that protects and promotes the civil rights of Asian Americans across this country through litigation, advocacy, education, organizing, and ALDEF works with communities across America to secure human rights for all. Thank you all again for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Intro 1867. As the voting rights organizer for All Deaf, I organize along attorneys and community organizers in 14 states and Washington, D.C. on the nation's largest Asian American exit poll to advocate for language access and to spot voting problems. I also register newly sworn citizens every Friday at the New York Southern District Courthouse in which people have told me that they have waited years, sometimes more than a decade, just to have a chance to participate in our country's democracy. I'm constantly blown away by their enthusiasm for voting. However, I am here today to speak for the working class Chinese immigrant women like my mother's colleagues at the Chinatown Bakery who have been in this century city, sorry, for more than two decades who are green card holders and who have contributed their tax dollars and their labor to the city, but cannot vote for their city council members and mayor. And we've spoken about non-citizen municipal voting in San Francisco and in uh, Maryland, so I'm not going to go into that. I also just want to add that in Vermont, as recently as June 2021, Montpellier and Winoski allowed non-citizens to vote in municipal election. And now it's New York's turn to make non-citizen municipal voting a reality. Just want to bring it back that for 34 years, from 1969 through 2003, New York allowed non-citizens residents to vote in school board elections without incident. This created the most diverse group of parents elected to have a say in their child's ed education. Although this initiative was done through the state authority, the initiative we're proposing today does not require the state's permission, and we hope voters get a chance to do the same. Since there is a president here with no issue, it's time for New York to allow green card holders and those who have work authorization to be incorporated into our vibrant New York City community and allow them to vote in municipal elections. Thank you all so much. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Caroline Scown to testify, followed by Wincy Tao and then Farah Salam. Caroline Scown, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Levin and members of the committee. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of Introduction 1867. I'm Caroline Scown, an adult literacy instructor at the Chinese American Planning Council. The mission of CPC is to promote the social and economic empowerment of Chinese American, immigrant, and low-income communities. CPC is also a member of the Our City, Our Vote Coalition. Intro 1867 would expand voting rights in New York City elections to nearly 1 million non-citizen New Yorkers, many of whom have been longtime community members, leaders, and contribute to the strength of our city in countless ways. They have a right to decide who represents them in municipal offices like the city council or mayor, as the decisions made on the city level directly impact them and their communities. The concept of non-citizen voting is not new, and many municipalities across the country have successfully implemented it. In fact, until school board were disbanded in 2002, New York City allowed non-citizens to vote in school board elections for over 40 years. I work with many New Yorkers through our adult literacy program at CPC, and I'd like to share what this legislation will mean to them and their families. So I recently finished teaching a class to prepare community members to take the citizenship exam, and more than half of my students weren't even eligible yet to apply for citizenship, but they were taking the class, many for the second or third time already, because they were so interested in learning about American history history and government and getting involved. When I talked with one of these students, Todd, about the ideas behind Intro 1867, he told me why Our City, Our Vote is such a powerful proposal to him, saying, non-citizens are living and working in the city just as everyone else. Their voices should be heard, their rights and ideas should be considered by the government too. Our community members do more than talk about civic engagement, they're committed to action. This spring, two of my students actually met with city lawmakers to advocate for adult literacy funding. Neither of them are citizens, but they're so invested in supporting adult literacy programs for their community that they were moved to testify. 
Over the years of our adult literacy program, dozens of our students have joined us to protest, testify, and speak up for what they believe in. Even though these New Yorkers are not citizens, they want a say in how our city is run. During this ongoing pandemic, half of all frontline essential workers are immigrants and one in five are non-citizen New Yorkers. These are our neighbors and colleagues who risked their lives over the last 18 months to keep our hospitals, groceries, and other essential services running. They deserve a voice in government and a way to hold that government accountable to them and their communities. We shouldn't be wary of letting more New Yorkers participate in our democracy and our city should continue to lead the fight to expand voting rights and be a model for the rest of the country. Currently, intro 1867 has 33 co-sponsors totaling more than enough votes to pass. Now is the time to empower our immigrant communities and uplift their voices. I urge the city council to do the right thing and pass this legislation immediately. Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to welcome Wincy Tao to testify, followed by Farah Salam and then Sarah El Sabai. Wincy Tao, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Acting Chair Levine and members of the Government Operations Committee, thank you for hosting this hearing today on Intro 1867. My name is Wincy Tao, the Civic Engagement Organizer for the Chinese Progressive Association. We are a nonprofit organization based in Manhattan's Chinatown and the Lower East Side, and we offer educational advocacy service and organizing programs such as ESL and citizenship classes, voter registration and civic engagement education that raise the community's living and working standards. If living in a democracy means that every voice counts, we need everyone to participate. As a daughter of immigrants and as the civic engagement organizer in Chinatown in the Lower East Side, I'm regularly tasked with registering people to vote. A common refrain I hear is, I'm not eligible or, I'm just a green card holder. And even though many are interested and would vote if given the right to do so, many are home health aides, construction workers, restaurant staff, the so-called essential workers. They're all part of a forgotten group that have no say in the direction of our city. We must restore the right to vote for these nearly 1 million taxpaying non-citizens in New York City. And if this were to become a reality, the Chinese Progressive Association would be more than willing to do the education and outreach needed for our community. Every voice must truly count. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Farah Salam to testify, followed by Sarah El Sabai, and then Gabenga Awanasi. Farah Salam, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, all, and uh, thank you to the uh, Chair Cabrera and members of the committee. Um, I want to thank everyone for allowing and inviting community-based organizations to testify on behalf of Introduction 1867 to expand voting rights in New York City elections um, to help 1 million non-citizen New Yorkers vote municip uh, municipally within New York City. My name is Farah Salam and I'm the Priority Area Specialist for the Arab American Family Support Center. I'm honored to testify today. Um, so our communities have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic since suffering from the lack of linguistically accessible resources and information needed to keep them safe. At the Arab American Family Support Center, we've been providing information, resources, and other essential PPE to our immigrant uh, and refugee essential workers throughout uh, New York City during the last 18 months. Um, however, because of working conditions, overcrowding and overextended healthcare services that have left families especially vulnerable to COVID-19 infection and fatalities, it's been very difficult for our community members to get what they need and to have their voices heard. Um, our organization has also been tasked with empowering the voices of our community um, by involving them in census work and involving them in providing benefits that they may not be able to receive federally, such as through NYC Care or other city-based programs. Um, however, despite the roles that our community members have played over the last 18 months as essential workers, um, and more visibly during the pandemic, they cannot vote. They are excluded from the opportunities that would allow them to contribute to civic society and to decide who represents them in civic 
uh, city council. Voting in Minnesota will promote a sense of civic duty, harness the vital contributions of immigrant New Yorkers into tangible political power, and ensure that all community members can participate in decisions that impact their everyday lives. To give you an example, my husband, he is a, he's been living in New York City longer than I have. He's been here for about 10 years, um, but he can't vote. He is here on a work visa and has been working for a pretty uh, large company based out of New York. Um, and in order to gain a sense of civic duty, he's been working on in mutual aid networks over the pandemic, over the course of the last 18 months during the pandemic, especially during the peak. And beyond that, he's been volunteering in civic and uh, in campaigns for city council, for um, Congress and other campaigns. However, despite all of this activity, he is unable to vote. Um, and it would definitely, make such a big difference to see the amount of work that our um, community members put in to uh, I'm, vote. Um, I'm going to end off with this. Um, we join our city, our vote, respectfully requesting the city to expand voting rights and be a model for the rest of the country, while other states and municipalities suppress voting rights for many living in vulnerable and low income areas. And we support the 33 council members who have signed on to support this policy by expanding voting rights for all New Yorkers. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. I hope you have all, all have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Sarah al Sabai to testify, followed by Gabenga Awanasi and then Yanesia Mata. Sarah al Sabai, you may begin a this announcement. Time um, starts. Members of the committee, thank you for uh, the opportunity to testify before you today on behalf of Intro 1867 to expand voting rights in New York City. My name is Sara El Sabaya and I work with the Arab American Association of New York's immigration team in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. The work our organization does in our community to promote democracy and voter engagement is unique. We serve immigrants from all over the Arab world who, before coming to the United States, lived in a place where the freedom to vote and to choose their own elected officials was something they simply had never experienced. It is an incredible, rewarding part of the work we do to introduce new Americans to democracy and to help them join in on participating in their government in a way they've never been able to before. Uh, even among those who have citizenship, a uh, disheartening high proportion of our population remains skeptical of the electoral system in New York. And many of the immigrants we serve are coming from places where elections, if they are held at all, are often little more than champs to enable those in power. On top of this, th there is a distrust held by uh, many in the Arab American community towards the federal, state, and city government as a result of discriminatory surveillance and policing practices our community has experienced over the last 20 years. Uh, the result of this is that our community has a shockingly uh, low rate of democratic participation and engagement. Today, as uh, you've already heard from countless organizations talking about how our city, our vote would empower countless immigrants from all over the world to participate in their government and make New York one of the most de democratic state, uh, cities in the country. But one of the most impactful things this law would do would be to create buy in, not and just buy in, not just in the city government, but in all levels of electoral government among immigrants who may not otherwise be inclined to do so. Building trust in America's democratic institutions is more important than now than ever. And by taking a sledgehammer to, to the walls with separate immigrants from their um, municipal government, we'll be doing exactly that. So with, the, with one city council vote and a stroke of the pen from Mayor de Blasio, we can empower a new generation of Arab Americans, Muslim Americans, and immigrants from all over the world to fully become a part of the government's uh, gover governance of the city they call home. We can take a stand against the disturbing anti-democratic trends we're seeing in states and cities across the country. And we can build trust uh, between long excluded communities and the city governments they have long felt separated and divided from. We urge the city council to pass our city, our vote into law and empower New York's dem democracy for the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Gabenga Awanasi to testify followed by Yesenia Mata and then Selene Yip. Gabenga Awanasi, you may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. 
time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Binga Wunusi, Project Manager at DSI International, a community-based organization in Queens areas of New York City. We're, we're into immigration integration, advocacy, mentoring, and empowerment. I am here this afternoon representing the community we serve. We join our voice with the voices of other coalition groups in support of the exciting legislation that has spun democracy in New York City so that new green card holders and those with work authorization will be allowed to vote in election for city level offices. Our community has been disenfranchised from performing their civic responsibilities in the areas of housing, street saving, policy, and so on. They do not even have a say on issues that affect the education of their children. As it stands today, we have close to a million green card holders and those with work authorization who pay their taxes regularly but have been denying the opportunity to vote at the municipal election. Some of these people are essential workers. We have the nurses, the doctors, the caregivers, the teachers, the food ventures who put their lives on the line during the pandemic to make sure that lives are safe. I am proud to be one of them. We are an essential part of everyday life and an asset to the survivor of the economy. Yet, we have been completely shut out of the political life of our city by not being able to be part of the decision that impact our daily lives. We do not have a say in the decision that affect the future of our children, the cleanness of our environment, and our local democracy. Passing of the bill, we allow this close to one million souls to be able to exercise their civic responsibilities and elect candidate of their choice that will represent them and make their choice hard. I therefore pledge that the government of our time look into this area critically and let this individual out of the bag by allowing them to perform their civic responsibilities without discrimination, fear, or intimidation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Yesenia Mata to testify, followed by Celine Yip and then MJ Akma. Yesenia Mata, you may begin upon the search and announcement. Time starts now. My name is Yesenia Mata. I am the executive director of La Colmena, a day labor and immigrant rights organization here in Stein Island. Throughout the entire pandemic, we have seen how the immigrant community stood up like they always have to ensure that the city of New York can continue running. This is why throughout the entire pandemic, the immigrant worker was called a hero. As someone who also serves in the US Army Reserves as a 31 Bravo military police, I further have seen the heroism of the immigrant community. Currently, there are many soldiers who are serving in uniform, who are not citizens, but they serve because they love this country, which only 1% of the population serve. So let that sink in especially for those that are against intro 1867. My question is what else does the immigrant community need to do to show certain elected officials that they care about the city of New York, that New York City is their home. If New York City prides itself of being one of the most diverse cities in the world, one of the most inclusive cities in the world, well, it is time to show it and to lead by example. We have some of the top attorneys, some of the top CBOs, and some of the best organizers. We can get intro 1867 to pass and implement it. It is time that we give the immigrant community the respect and the right that they deserve. Thank you for letting me testify. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Celine Yip to testify, followed by MJ Akma and then Ava Santos Velos. Celine Yip. Right. Time starts now. Uh, I believe the, the chair. Oh. Sorry, Yusenia, I just want to thank you so much for your service to our country. Thank you. Thank you. Celine, you. Time starts now. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm Celine Yip of Nonprofit New York. 
Um, I'm here to speak in support of passing intro 1867 to expand voting rights in New York City elections to nearly 1 million non-citizen New Yorkers. Nearly 1 million of our fellow New Yorkers are denied the right to vote. And these New Yorkers contribute to our city. They have been paying taxes, have started almost half of all of the small businesses, and during this ongoing pandemic, continued working as essential workers. Um, yet back in June, nearly 1 million of these New Yorkers were unable to choose the elected officials who would go on to make decisions that affect their lives every day. Um, these New Yorkers are barred from being able to hold the powerful accountable. A nonprofit New York, uh, we recognize the past here has provided powerful illustrations of why we must not make, take our democracy for granted. Making sure that all New Yorkers have their voices heard is not partisan or political. These are responsibilities. This issue is important to nonprofit New York and personal to me. I am the daughter of a Cambodian refugee. Uh, I grew up in a household so poor we could not afford heating and had recurring bouts of housing instability. Because of this, at times, my mother was forced to work two full-time jobs. My mother worked hard, she contributed to our economy, she was engaged in our community, and she deserves her right to vote. Luckily, because of her refugee status, my mother received U.S. citizenship, but she is not the norm. Um, the naturalization process can take years to complete and is expensive. Born-born residents like my mother deserve and need the right to elect someone to represent their needs. Um, 33 council members have put their name on this bill. That is more than enough to pass. I urge the city council to do the right thing and pass this legislation immediately. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Celine. I'd now like to welcome MJ Achman to testify, followed by Ava Santos Velos, and then Adil Ahmed. MJ Achman, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, Acting Chair Levin and members of the Committee on Government Operations. Um, my name is MJ Okuma with the Human Services Council, a membership organization representing 170 New York Human Services nonprofits and a proud member of the Our City Our Vote Coalition. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify in support of the intro 1867. As mentioned by both the administration and the campaign finance board earlier, our city often turns to human services CBOs to promote civic engagement and quickly spread breaking information about new and evolving government policies due to our sector's deep roots in our communities. Yet at the same time, there are many human services advocates, workers, clients, neighbors, and supporters who are completely left out of, of these critical decisions that affect their community by being barred from voting in local elections. It is time to change that. We know that politically engaged communities lead to more positive outcomes and city government and human services organizations must work together um, to break down the barriers that prevent engagement. Intro 1867 is a vital step forward in ensuring people who live here and who make our city and neighborhoods who they are, or what they are, are able to choose their elected leadership. Um, passing this bill has always been the right decision in order to restore and expand voting rights to nearly 1 million New Yorkers who live here and pay taxes while having no say in how that money is being spent. But in the wake of COVID-19, this bill is even more urgent. Passing and implementing this bill will mean New Yorkers who have been disproportionately impacted by this pandemic, while at the same time being excluded from many COVID-19 relief programs, will have a voice in how our city rebuilds. Half of all frontline workers, um, frontline essential workers are immigrants and one in five are non-citizens. We cannot ask these New Yorkers to risk their lives to keep us happy and keep our city running while also denying them the right to vote. We cannot have a truly fair and equitable recovery while denying these communities that have been among the most impact, impacted a voice in how the city budget will be spent and who represents them. As of this morning, 34 council members have put their names on this bill that is more than enough to pass. We greatly, we, we urge speaker, the speaker to swiftly schedule this bill to a vote after today's hearing and the council to pass this bill as quickly as possible. Um, human services providers are ready to do our part to ensure that impacted community members will have the information and resources they need to participate in local elections once this bill is implemented. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you so much, MJ. Thank you. I would now like to welcome Ava Santos Velos to testify, followed by Adil Ahmed and then Eamon Nassim. Ava Santos Velos, you may be on the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. My name is Eva Santos Velos, and I am a Dominican DACA recipient. I've been residing in the city 
since I was nine years old. Um, this is the city that I went to school. This is the city that I grew up. Um, when I be first became a DACA recipient, this is the city that I first started doing my contribution economically. The first city that I pay my share of taxes has been New York City and the only one for the last eight years that I have been a DACA recipient. Um, during the pandemic, there were many, many of us out there protecting the city that we have known since we were ch children, including myself. Um, not also just being an undocumented immigrant, I feel like I deserve um, the voting rights to choose who is in, ch in, in, in chair. Being a mom of three U.S. children, U.S. citizens that have that were born in the city, I feel like I should have a right as a parent to have a say who, on their future, is elected on on those chairs, on their education, how safe the streets are going to be. Um, I had the right to 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 like to say like um, just like every other parent out there on how the future of my children are. Um, and many other TPS holders and DACA recipients, um, just like me, I was raised in the city um, and I contribute daily. I work for the city. I am a volunteer for United We Dream Action. I am fighting and advocating for so many things out there in the city that I grew up. Um, my mom has been here since the eighties and she never had a right and then never had a say to um, decide uh, and make those changes for me. And I wanna have in the future, the, the right to be able to have a say on my kids' future um, that were born in the city and they are US citizens. Like, why not? Why I'm not assertive of that? And many others out there. I grew up here. I am just as, as New Yorkers as many other out there. I have, all my taxes have been paid here. All my, I went to school, to middle school, to high school, to college here. Every single one of us have contributed to the city some way, somehow. And I just feel like, um, we are the servant of this. And I want to thank Idanis Cabrera, who is also a Dominican, for bringing this um, intro 1867. I feel really, really happy and proud of, of being a Dominican and him representing us on this matter. And I really hope that me as a New Yorker, just a DACA recipient, they're hearing me out. I'm just like every, I'm, I, I am that person that you guys are fighting for this bill for. Um, and I'm, I'm screaming that we, we do deserve this. Um, we have worked very hard and my children, and, and, and it's the future of our children who, who is in the line for this. And thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you very much, Eva. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Adil Ahmed to testify, followed by Iman Nassim and then Leah Giddens. Adil Ahmed, you may be getting on the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Adil Ahmed. I'm a community organizer for the Black Institute. We are a think tank that does research and action on issues through the lens of people of color. Um, I am going to be reading the testimony of Mr. Victor Babafemi, uh, who cannot make it here today because he is a hardworking New Yorker. So good afternoon, members of the committee. I am Mr. Victor Babafemi. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on behalf of intro 1867 to expand voting rights in New York City elections to nearly 1 million uh, non-citizen New Yorkers. We live in a democracy, yet 1 million of our fellow New Yorkers are denied the right to vote. These are our coworkers, neighbors, and friends. Many of them have lived in this city for a long time. I am one of these 1 million. We are New Yorkers who have been contributing to our city. We've been paying taxes and have started almost half of the small businesses in our city. Many are active in our communities, and yet back in June, one million of us were not able to choose the elected officials that make decisions affecting our day-to-day -day lives. This is not right. I live in East New York, Flatbush neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York, represented by Councilwoman Farrah Lewis, who is a sponsor of this bill. I am a behavioral health associate and work with the NYC uh, Health Hospital. I have lived in my neighborhood for five years. I live in a democracy and yet nearly 1 million immigrant New Yorkers like me can vote in local elections. I am a resident of the city and I live here, work here, go to school here, raise families here and pay taxes here. We deserve a vote on issues that affect us and the direction of our city. Half of all frontline essential workers are immigrants and one in five are non-citizens. We are New Yorkers, literally risk our lives to keep ourselves healthy and keep the city running. And we are denied participation of vote in our taxes are spent and who represents us in government. I support the introduction 1867-2020 because it will strengthen our democracy by allowing nearly 1 million of us New Yorkers who are green card holders or valid work authorizations to vote in New York City local elections. 
Once again, during this ongoing pandemic, half of all frontline essential workers are immigrants and one in five are non-citizen New Yorkers. We ask them to risk their lives serving as medical professionals, keeping pharmacies and grocery stores open and keeping our buildings clean. How can we tell them thanks for making sure the city kept running while the rest of us work from home and then also tell them that they don't care and they don't have a real voice in government? They have no real way of holding the powerful accountable. We shouldn't be afraid of letting more New Yorkers participate in our democracy. We should be leading the fight to expand voting rights and be a model for the rest of the country. So many other places are taking away people's voting rights. We have to stand up and fight back against voter suppression and disenfranchisement. New York City has to lead the country and say that people who live here, who make New York City what it is, should be able to choose their elected leadership. 34 council members have already put their names on this bill. That is more than enough votes to pass. I urge the city council to do the right thing and pass this legislation immediately. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Eamon Nassim to testify, followed by Leah Giddens and then Mama Seba. Eamon Nassim, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. We can come back to Iman Nassim. Sounds like there's an audio issue. We'll come back. Um, I'd now like to welcome Leah Giddens to testify, followed by Mama Sema, and then Tawaki Kamatsu. Leah Giddens, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Hello, uh, thank you to Chair Cabrera, Council Member Levin, and members of the New York City Council Committee on Governmental Operations for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Leah Giddens, and I am the Senior Program and Policy Manager at Women Creating Change, which is a nonprofit that increases civic engagement for women in New York City, specifically for those who have been systemically excluded from civic processes. I am testifying today in support of intro 1867 to expand voting rights to nearly 1 million New Yorkers with work authorizations and green cards. At WCC, we've been advocating for voting rights and civic engagement for more than 100 years. Having been directly involved in the women's suffrage movement, WCC is proud to raise our voices once again to expand democracy as part of the Our City, Our Vote Coalition. As many others have shared today, immigrants have always been vital to our city, and never has that been more true than during the pandemic. Um, as others have shared, half of all frontline essential workers are immigrants, and one in five are non-citizens. New York City cannot have a fair and just COVID-19 recovery plan if the New Yorkers who are most affected by the pandemic cannot vote for the people who will make these recovery decisions. We owe it to our frontline heroes to finally include their voices and their votes as our city moves forward. In New York City, the quintessential city of immigrants, democracy, democracy should be inclusive of and accountable to everyone who calls it home. The city should be encouraging greater civic engagement and mobilizing our communities to advocate for good public policies that invest in and enhance our city. Expanding the right to vote in city elections provides more New York Yorkers to have the opportunity to have a say on issues that affect them, and it will strengthen the voices of all of our communities. On a personal note, I was born and raised in New York City and have lived here most of my life. I want all of my neighbors to have the right to participate in this core civic process. Passing intro 1867 is the right thing to do, and it would make me even prouder to be a lifelong New Yorker. Thank you to the more than 34 city council members who already support this bill, and especially thank you to council member Rodriguez. I urge the council to immediately put this bill to a vote to realize a more just and equitable democracy. WCC looks forward to partnering with the city council to create the fully enfranchised, just and representative city that we know is possible. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Mama Sema to testify, followed by Tawaki Kamatsu. Mama Sema, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. 
Good evening, everyone and members of the committee. My name is Mama Salma. I'm the Civic Education Program Coordinator for the Muslim Community Network, MCN. As a citywide organization, MCN strives to develop leadership, social and political participation of Muslim by providing them with skills and the ability to change the public narrative around Muslim in our city. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the introduction of 1867. Um, first, I'm here, I'm here first speaking as a New Yorker, but also a New Yorker who experienced what it's like to be an immigrant in our city. I want to start off by sharing a snapshot of my story. Um, I moved from one of the least democratic and poorest African country, country in the, uh, on the face of the earth um, to the Bronx in 2013. Despite language barriers and my very limit, limited education background, I was given the opportunity to start over and attend high school through a non-citizen education program um, like the partnership of the New York City Department of Education and, inter, and the International Network. There, I was eventually awarded a scholarship of $220,000 um, to one of the top liberal arts schools of the state. I graduated last year with a bachelor's degree in economics, and I'm currently working to give back to the community that welcomed me and nurtured me. Um, I share my story because I want to acknowledge and thanks those who paved the way for me as a young immigrant and my peers to come into the city and be given a voice to educate myself and participate, which eventually led to the first step of my academic success. To me and the rest of the immigrant community, introduction 1867 isn't any different. This bill is an opportunity for our dem democracy to give a voice to almost a million fellow New Yorker in fully contributing and deciding what is right for them and their city. Um, council members, I urge you all to put your name on this bill as it is not only the right thing to do, uh, but also we would be proud to say that you have allowed more New Yorker um, to participate in the democratic process of the city. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Tawaki Kamatsu to testify, followed by Nicole Rojas and then Leticia Reyes. Tawaki Kamatsu, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, yes, we can hear you. So, hi, this is Tuolaki Kalatsu. Mr. Levin, I've testified in numerous uh, meetings that you've uh, conducted. Um, I've testified to you about the fact that I was illegally prevented from attending public meetings. This uh, meeting today, this hearing today is about voters' rights, uh, voter suppression. Um, I got some audio recordings from the CCRB about complaints I filed against NYPD Inspector Howard Redmond, the mayor's head of security. So with regards to the audience for this meeting, um, this is what he had to say to uh, Judith Lay of the CCRB about why um, he was ex excluding me from public meetings that were public forums. To be there. And why wasn't you allowed to be there? I was allowed to be there to begin with. He's banned from town halls. He's not allowed in the town hall. Okay, so, so I think one of the officers out front inadvertently left. I didn't even know where the gentleman was sitting until he grabbed my attention as I'm walking across the floor. Okay. If I can ask, this town hall, was it open to the public? No, it was not open to the public. It's sitting by the Okay. Okay. Um, and you said, uh, I know that when we, last time when we spoke, um, Mr. Gamatsu appeared to be allowed into town hall. So when did he get banned from town halls? Well, it's gotten worse, his speech, to the folks that, civilians that work at City Hall. I think they have less tolerance as far as, you know, what we're used to is cops, people cursing at us and stuff, but we're kind of used to it, you know, and I'm going to use some, you know, that you're going to have to listen to the next of So anyway, um, so yeah, so this meeting today is about voter um, voting rights, voter suppression. In three days, the mayor is going to have a public uh, research fair meeting in Kew Gardens. That was the first time in um, 2017, on July 18th, 2017, where Michael Gartland and Gloria Pasmino, these 
uh, Centers in Journalism. They were standing right in front of us while I was talking to the mayor. I told the mayor that uh, Mr. Redman kept me out of his April 27, 2017 town hall before Mr. Levin. Um, I told you in October 2017 that I was being illegally kept out of your uh, public town hall meeting in St. Francis College in Brooklyn. Uh, you told me that there was nothing that you could do in spite of the fact that you were the moderator for that meeting and you had a duty pursuant to New York City Charter 1116 to intervene. So currently I've got federal litigation and I'm going to be filing a brief in that lawsuit um, basically against most of the city council members. Um, I'm going to also submit written testimony for, with further, further details, but for the members of the audience, if they want to intervene, take a look at the case of Komatsu versus City of New York, case number is uh, 20. CV 7046, it's assigned to the Southern District, signed to Federal Judge Edgardo Ramos. If you're looking to intervene in that case, I would glad, I would love to have you. That's the end of my um, testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Komatsu, thank you. I'd now like to welcome Nicole Rojas to testify, followed by Leticia Reyes and then Steven Espinoza. Rojas, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for holding this hearing and for allowing me to testify. Uh, my name is Nicole Rojas, and I am the community organizer at Mixteca Organization. A Mixteca Organization is a community-based organization located in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, that addresses the critical needs in health, education, social, and legal issues uh, facing the burgeoning Mexican and Latin American immigrant community. Over the years, our space has become a second home to community members. It's a safe space to receive services free of cost in their language. We are asking for your support for intro 1867 to allow immigrants the right to vote in municipal elections. What attracts immigrants to the country? It is the opportunity and the freedom, yet every day they are being denied of their basic rights to use their voice and vote for decisions and decision makers that impact their everyday lives. We often have community members who seek support in applying for citizenship in Spanish. To qualify to take the citizenship test in Spanish, one must be over 50 and have been a resident for at least 20 years or over 55 and be a resident for at least 15 years. And you may ask, why can't they just learn English? For some community members we serve who seek to become citizens, learning English would be their third language as they come from indigenous communities. Language barriers is just one of the many barriers that our community faces to become citizens. They spend most of their lives as New York residents contributing to New York, yet have no say in their local government. Our Latin American and indigenous communities is made up of essential workers who are on the front lines and continue to be to keep the city going. They were one of the most affected communities and continue to be to this day. We will see the long lasting effects of this pandemic and we need the immigrant community involved in democracy to be able to actually heal and recover in community. We cannot keep excluding our community, especially in these difficult moments. They need to have a say in the decision making process in order for New York to recover, not for some, but for all. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Leticia Reyes to testify followed by Steven Espinoza, and then Shola Oyelohunu. Oye uh, Leticia Reyes, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Sorry for the noise, but I had to pick it up my daughter from the school. My name is Leticia Reyes. I am 48 years old, mother of six children, and I'm originally from Mexico. As a Mexican immigrant, I know the challenges we had to face with a new language. But that is no matter for us, because we are here learning. Can you see us? We are co-workers, neighbors, and friends. Many of us have employment authorization, but we are, um, and we are working here, we are watching our children go. And many of us have lived in this, this city for a long time. We are here make, making our city grow more and more. We are working very hard because New York is our city, it's our home. We live here with our families. And it's for this reason, we want to have the right to vote. 
for our civil leaders. I am here and I want to vote. I am living here and I want to vote. I want to be accounted for and I deserve the right to vote like everyone else. We live in the democracy and almost one million of New Yorkers are denied their rights. We want to make decisions that affect our lives every single day. I live in Brooklyn for more than 15 years and I serve to my community as PTA president of my daughter's school for four years. A school safety member for four years at PIS IS-157. I was member of CEC District 14 for two years. A New York Department of Job and Community Development District 14 as a treasurer for two terms and secretary for one term. And the last year, I became a promoter at the state organization. But I want to be accountable for more. I have the right to vote. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leticia. I'd now like to welcome Stephen Espinoza to testify, followed by Shola Oye Lohanu, followed by Eamon Nassim. Stephen Espinoza, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Good morning, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Steven Espinoza. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on such a critical bill, a bill designed to expand voting rights in New York City elections to nearly 1 million non-citizen New Yorkers. I am here today in support of the undercounted voters to demand their voices be heard. In every election, the future of our city is put at stake. Our elections attempt to tackle issues New Yorkers face from economic uncertainty, racial injustice to providing quality health care and public education. Yet there are nearly 1 million non-citizen New Yorkers who are left out of the voting process. A 2019 voter analysis report concluded that minority turnout is consistently lower than turnout among white voters. And that this pattern can be attributed to the long-standing historical barriers to participation for minorities. There are consequences to this. I've seen it firsthand within my own community, Sunset Park, Brooklyn. A dire housing crisis where families are being forced out to move of their home because of rent they can no longer afford. How can we fully address an issue like this if we are barring the right to vote to those struggling the most? There are an estimated 16,000 non-citizens in Community District 7, which includes Sunset Park. These 16,000 immigrants are families, students, and workers of our community. But we don't account them for, for them in our elections, yet we do hold them accountable to paying taxes and obeying our laws. I am privileged to have the right to vote, but these thousands upon thousands of non-citizens deserve that right as much as I do. The non-citizens who we deny the vote are the same New Yorkers who are teachers and students, physicians and nurses and transit and construction workers. They are the working class of our city. But we are saying no to the immigrant Mexican mother who wants to improve a child's education or to the 75 year old Chinese immigrant who has lived here for 25 years who just wants quality health care. We say no to them simply because they are not citizens. But it is time to change and it is long overdue to change our undemocratic voting laws and past introduction 1867. We are demanding with the almost million undercounted voters in New York City to urge you all to pass this bill. We are just asking for the bare minimum. Let their voices be heard. Thank you and thank you for your time. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Shola Oyelohunu to testify, followed by Eamon Nassim. Shola Oye Lohanu, excuse me. You may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. Time starts now. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. 
My name is Olushala Oyelounu. <laughs> um, I'm a member of African Communities Together, ACT. ACT is one of the coalition members of our city, our vote. I want to thank the community for giving me the opportunity to testify on behalf of Introduction 1867 to expand voting rights in New York City elections to nearly 1 million non citizen New Yorkers. We live in a democracy, and yet nearly one million of our fellow New Yorkers are denied the right to vote. These are our co-workers, neighbors, and friends. Many of them have lived in the city for a very long time. These New Yorkers have been contributing to our city, and they've been paying taxes, and have started almost half of all the small businesses in the city. Many are active in their communities, and yet back in June, one million of these people were unable to choose the elected officials who make decisions that affect their lives every day. I am one of such immigrants, I am one of such essential workers, and I was not able to vote. During the ongoing pandemic, half of all these frontline essential workers are immigrants, and one in five are non-citizen New Yorkers. We ask them to risk their lives serving as medical professionals, keeping pharmacies and grocery stores open, and keeping our buildings clean. There's no better way to tell them thank you for doing all this for us if we don't allow them the right to vote. Or do we say that we don't care that, the, that they have no real voice in government, that they have no real way to hold the powerful accountable? So much has already been said by other testifiers but I just want to say quickly that um, we shouldn't be afraid of letting more New Yorkers participate in our democracy. We should be leading the fight to expand voting rights and be a model for the rest of the country. Other places are taking away people's voting rights. They are standing up and then um, fighting back against um, voter suppression and disenfranchisement. New York City has to lead the country and say that people who, are, who live here who make New York City what it is should be able to choose their elected leadership. 33 council members have put their names on this bill. We feel that that is more than enough force to pass. So we urge the city to do the right thing and pass this legislation immediately. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Bye-bye. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to welcome Eamon Nassim to testify. Eamon Nassim. Time starts now. Uh, we can hear Ms. Nassim. I think you're having audio connectivity issues. Ms. Nassman, you can try um, logging out of the meeting and then logging back in if you want to try that. Uh, this is Chief Sergeant at Arms Council to the committee. We have more people on the list. Uh, call the next one while uh, Ms. Nassim uh, logs back in, please. Thank you. I don't believe there's anyone else on the list, Sergeant. Got it. She's coming back in now. Yeah, sorry, we still have no audio on you, Ms. Nassim.
No, we still don't hear you. Unless you have a headset you could plug in, maybe that would work. Can you hear me now? All right, we got you now. Yeah. Okay. Um, Starting time. Sorry about the voice. I wasn't sure why my computer is not working. Uh, my name is Iman Nasim. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I'm a DACA recipient. I want to I want to say on behalf of all non-citizens that we all deserve to work um, for both because we've been working here for for a long time, we live in US and we pay taxes. We need the system to change. We need a better, um, a better candidate to represent New York and hold USA that will improve the city, will do better everyone's life, fix all the issues that matters and make everyone's life living easier. That's why I want to vote I want to have the legal right to vote so that way everyone else in this in this country living can vote and we all have all the equal rights like everyone else who living in this US. And yeah, just make sure, I just wanted to make it short and simple. All I'm trying to say is that we all deserve to pay, right, to vote for New York City. And Everyone works hard over here. We've been living for too many years in here. We all pay taxes because of COVID. A lot of people has lost jobs and stuff. And a lot of people who were essential worker were immigrants. So yes. Um, giving, voting will change the, voting will change the way how equality people gets in this state. Um, we get to choose who's the right candidate who will actually do things better for this country, like fix all the issues and matters that goes on that goes years and years and change the, the, the law. The laws is like very outdated and very old that doesn't even improve. And this is like 21st century and we've been stuck with the same issues that never get fixed, the power of certain people who doesn't want to change the system. And we are in the same circle of the same kind of people who are doing the same thing and the country hasn't improved. World is changing. A lot of countries has improved so many ways, but I don't see that improvement in the US. I want to see that improvement. Like we live in such a big country, but there are so many things, so many matters, so many issues It's still so outdated that doesn't get improved. And we, have, we are stuck with the same circle of people running the politics who doesn't want to change the system. So I want to know why can't we change that? Why do we have to be stuck with the same old repeat and repeated things that not even getting changed? Like why don't everybody has right in this country equally to do improve the country? That's all, thank you. Thank you so much, Iman, thank you. Thank you. I believe uh, that concludes the witnesses who have registered and are on the Zoom call. Um, so at this time, if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no hands raised, I'll now turn it over to Chair Levin for closing remarks. 
Um, thank you so much uh, to um, to all. Sorry, I apologize if you hear my son in the in the background. Um, I want to I want to thank all committee staff: C.J. Murray, Emily Forgione, Elizabeth Cronk, and Sebastian Baki for their uh, work on this um, on this hearing. I want to thank all the members of the public that came to testify, um, experts in the field of immigration law. Um, the Board of Elections, the uh, representatives from the de Blasio administration, uh, campaign finance board. Um, I greatly appreciate everybody's testimony and work on this issue. Um, it's my hope that, um, that we can all work um, collaboratively and collectively over the, uh, the coming months um, to advance this piece of legislation. And I want to thank especially Councilmember Adonis Rodriguez uh, for his steadfast advocacy in this bill and uh, stewardship in the legislative process. Um, and with that, at 3.26 PM, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.